this is the big kickoff guys this is the kickoff to earth month pretty soon it's going to be mirth uh earth year right next year will be earth year um and um it's a, it's a very exciting time for us here we're all coming out of this uh, terrible pandemic and um, you know we still have some uh, a road to, to get through but uh, we see some light at the end of the tunnel and, it, and it's a very uh, exciting time for us uh, environmentalists and us people that are working in this space to uh, you know affect change um, and uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming in and I like to thank all the people that have uh, have um, volunteered to uh, speak here at the beginning and um, also all the people that are going to be monitoring the uh, breakout rooms at the end of the evening. And, um, you know, as always, a huge thank you to all the volunteers that uh, participate with the CACs, the, the, the environmental uh, committees, the sustainability committees, the green, I would, I, if we, we have a whole list of names that we all call ourselves. Uh, I like to um, uh, call us all CACs just as a colloquial uh, uh, phrase. So, um, uh, I do want to mention a couple things. There's uh, 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 four groups that uh, just um, we just couldn't get it together, and they're huge um, uh, contributors to the county. And um, one is the Cure 100. Um, they have an excellent uh, toolkit. Um, all four of these are going to be in the breakout session, so they'll have more time to um, you know talk about their. Uh, organizations and what they have going on. Um, you know, Chandu and, and Leo were leading the charge on the Cure 100 coming out of um, a Croton, and it's a great toolkit for residents of your town. Uh, I also want to um, uh, point out uh, Mothers Out Front, who's done a, done a lot of great advoca advocacy work, and they uh, are mostly based out of uh, you know, the, the river towns over there, but they're expanding. I know it is a national organization and um, we're happy to have them here and they'll be contributing also in the breakout sessions. We also, I really wanna uh, point out healthy yards and, and the pollinator pathways. Uh, Fiona Mitchell and Philippine Hoagland, uh, we're really, uh, they've been a huge contributor to across the county. A lot of people have really gotten into the space of, uh, you know, saving our, um, our, our our breeding ground and our feeding stations for all of our bees and butterflies and all of our pollinators, which obviously are important. Um, they seem to be our canary in the coal mine these days, and we really need to take care of them, um, you know, just for our own livelihood. And um, I also want to recognize Sunrise Movement. Um, I have a I have a new assistant here. I'm glad to have him. He's a part of the Sunrise Movement. Um, and there's a, a couple people that are on here. I know Caitlin and uh, probably Sebastian are on here. I don't see them quite frankly, but I'm sure they are. Uh, they're the, the diligent young, uh, young kids and um, uh, young adults. And um, uh, it's good to see them, um, you know, participating and uh, moving the ball. Um, I also, I would like to really thank the League of Women Voters um, so they also were going to have an event on today, this morning, and uh, we worked out a deal with them. Um, they were very nice. Actually, they, there was no deal made. They were very nice. They said, we can move our date to whenever it's convenient for you. And that's going to be on April 7th. And that's going to be based around um, all the municipalities that are working towards climate smart community certification um, and or moving to silver. Um, so there's going to be, um, I believe it's a, a uh, Hudson Valley Regional Council is going to be involved and probably DEC going to be involved, but that's a League of Women Voters. We'll add the uh, link to that in the chat uh, for everybody. But, um, uh, you know, I'm going to ramble on all day, and I'll, but I'll stop here. And I'm going to pass it over to um, pass it over to my boss, um, George Latimer. Um, he's uh, we all know him. We all love him. Um, and I'm not going to pitch to get him voted in November. Okay. I just did. Well, so we'll, we'll make that happen. I'll tell you, you know, elections matter. And especially in our space here, you know, of, uh, you know, climate change and sustainability and the environment, it really makes a difference. Um, we have a lot of great elected officials around the county. We're very fortunate in that regard. We have wonderful mayors and supervisors that, that get it, that are on the ball and doing what they can in their local space. And, um, and George is doing it on a, on a, on a county basis. So he, he's, I, I'll bring something to him and he's like, you know, that sounds good, Pete, you know, flesh it out with the other departments. Let's make it happen. Uh, so 
the man who needs no introduction, um, I've done with my introdu introduction there, George, and uh, thank you very much, and you're on. Thank you, George. Thanks very much, Pete, and, and thank you for all your hard work. Every time you call me your boss, I just say we work together. Yeah, we, have okay. different we have different responsibilities, but you're doing a terrific job. And I have to say online here is Catherine Parker, a number of county legislators. Chris Johnson is with us, Ruth Walter, probably some other ones that I didn't see when I did my scan through. And it was the Board of Legislators a number of years ago that, that created the position that Pete serves in now. And their vision at the time was to have somebody, I don't know if they envisioned Pete the person, but somebody in the administration who would be a point person for environmental issues, energy issues, sustainability issues, because the county government wasn't structured that way. We're structured for functions, environmental facilities, like a recycling MRF and other things, but not, not for policy. And so what I hope that, uh, you know, Catherine and other legislators who were there at the creation of this position now look and see what Pete's doing uh, as exactly what they had hoped for, the energy and the drive, because whatever comes out of this, it's going to have to be cooperative and not just the administration or the legislature, but both of us together. And uh, that's why I recognize Chris Johnson and Ruth Walter and Catherine Park and my other colleagues in the legislature also working side by side with local governments. As I scanned quickly, I saw Lena Crandall from Scarsdale. I saw Jim Creighton from Cortland and Janice Duarte from Mount Vernon. And there are others, forgive me if, if I skipped over, but we begin this whole process of talking about our environmental agenda as understanding that, that what's in front of us is huge. There's a massive challenge. It's a worldwide challenge. It's much bigger than a county or a municipality. And it, it, it cries out for us to work cooperatively. And as much as, um, and I've worked in the political process. The environment is an issue that we have to do everything we can to make bipartisan, everything we can do to reach across the lines and not see ourselves as in party A or party B, but rather united on these particular issues, because if we don't, the, the alternative is pretty, pretty stark. I told a story uh, two days ago when we had a symposium at Westchester Community College. Any of you who were there for that, and at Harkham is one I see, uh, I'm gonna tell the same story again. So forgive me for repeating myself, but uh, I, I think it's important for me to describe how I came to my deep-rooted environmentalism. Uh, the first Earth Day was April of 1970. For some of you, that's a historical date. Some of you remember where you were and you know, you're a toddler or wherever you were in your life. I was a high school senior at Mount Vernon High School and it was April and we graduated in June. So you can just imagine what a graduating senior was thinking in late April, two months before a high school graduation. We were just about ready to do nothing every day and just sort of post into uh, leaving high school and having our graduation fun. And uh, on that particular day, and I wasn't aware that it was Earth Day per se, a friend of mine came to me, I think it was in the cafeteria at the end of lunch. He said, what are you doing after school? And I said, nothing. What, what are you doing? He says, well, there's a group of people going over to the ball field and we're cleaning up the high school field. It's not the official football field, that was Memorial Field. But there's a field on the other side of uh, the Cross County from Mount Vernon, how you walk on a pedestrian walkway over. He said, we're going over there, we're gonna clean up the field. And I said, why would I wanna do that after school? And he said, there's gonna be girls there. And I said, count me in. And so thus began my environmental uh, commitment uh, to hang out with some girls who were cleaning up, and boys who were cleaning up a field. And uh, you know, on such a, a thin reed, you begin to understand that your environment matters around you. And I, and when I tell that story because when we look at the challenge of climate crisis and the scientists, and I am no scientist, when the scientists try to explain to us what's happening with the greenhouse gases, you can have a couple of different responses to that. One response is to deny it. There are people who look at the sky, today's a foggy, cloudy day, but on another day where the sun is shining, if you walk outside and you breathe what feels to you like fresh, clean air, or you look out at a watershed, I was at the Hudson River, the Long Island Sound, and some of the inland reservoir lakes, over the course of the last week, because it's beautiful. And, you know, what pollution, what could, what could change this? We have, you know, how could we be under a threat, uh, an existential threat with what I see? Some people look at it that way. Other people <laughs> will look at it and they'll hear the science and the science is beyond their, their grasp and capabilities. And that would be me. I was never, uh, you know, I was never a hard science kid in biology and, and, and uh, chemistry and physics. I had the classes, I got through them, I passed my regions, but you know, it, it, it didn't grasp me. So when people start talking about the complicated elements of CO2 release and, and capture, you know, it's easy to get lost in that. 
And then also, and the third concern is the magnitude of it, that, that the challenges that we have are so great. Uh, I'll refer to Janet again. She showed a graphic when she gave her presentation and she showed a bathtub uh, that represented an almost full bathtub of CO2 and a faucet that was emitting more emissions, like an open faucet and pouring more into the bathtub. And then one little drain pipe at the bottom of it, which represented the totality of our efforts to cleanse the environment and how, how we were draining something, but not enough, and certainly not enough to offset the amount of emissions. And, and very clearly uh, in that graphic, the bathtub would overflow. Hopefully, Janet, I've described your graphic accurately. It, it made enough of an impression upon me to repeat it. Today. But the challenge is so great. And then, and then the question is, what do we do about that? And, and the answer is what each of you do and what and I do right now within the world that we live in is what matters. And they will be a multitude of small but important initiatives that when added together will be the difference. When Pete and I talk about what we can do at the county level, we have some initiatives underway. You're well aware of them. Uh, our commitment to convert our bus fleet and our automotive fleet from a diesel or a standard gasoline to hybrid and electric vehicles. Um, we're committed to um, working with, uh, and I see Michelle Sterling online here, and I assume Ron Shulhoff is here too, to follow their path uh, toward assisting uh, and advancing the proper uh, segmentation of food waste from the burn it at Charles Point waste stream to the let's compost it uh, environmentally sensitive stream, that the county has a role to play in that. And we have a role in planting Westchester, which Pete is going to launch. We have a role in energy reduction and more, many more things that we can be doing as a county. And then as I look and, and I scan and I see people that I, that I know, uh, a Rob Barron from the River Towns, a Lori Fontanis from my home community of Rise City, and the initiatives that, that all across this county are being done by people on this Zoom, I realize it's a thousand of those activities that we need to do. And after we do a thousand, then we need to do 2,000 more. I said as much at Croton uh, when I said, this is what we're doing and we need to do more. This is what we're doing, we need to do more. We can't be satisfied because that, that tube at the bottom of the bathtub is not large enough to address the problems at hand. But we can't let the magnitude of the problem freeze us up. It, it can't make us stop trying to be creative and thoughtful in everything we do. I've been limited to 915, which is a good thing uh, because like Pete, I too can ramble on, but my understanding of the environment is somewhat better than it was when I was a high school senior looking for girls, uh, but it is not at the level of a scientific analysis that I could hold court. But I do know we have to do more. I have to do more. You have to do more. Let's figure out how to do it together. Let's figure out how to do it regardless of our political party. Let's figure out about how we do that together regardless if you're in a town, village, city, or county. Let's figure out how we can do that with the resources we have and the resources that we can get our hands on. And if we can do all of those things, then at least we'll know in our heart that we took this challenge seriously and we did everything we could. I hope this is a wonderful conference for everybody participating. Thank you for letting me share a few thoughts and we, uh, we all travel together. I wanted to point out there's a, uh, I talked, we have a board that was appointed by George. Um, uh, it's for the climate crisis task force and there are nine individuals. And I, I spoke with uh, many of them last night and uh, something that I've been banding around for a while. And uh, what I would like to do is, is, is have them work um, on coming up with some sort of repurposed version of the uh, environment, uh, Environmental Management Council. Um, and at the least have, uh, you know, quarterly Zoom meetings small like this, so bringing the groups together uh, but much smaller than this uh, evening. It would be just like a, an hour on a quarterly basis. And I'm just floating the idea out there now. Um, uh, but there's been a lot of excitement from the, the committee, um, the board that has been appointed. And um, there'll be more news coming out about that. But I did want to just float that out there. Um, and uh, I'd also, um, I just now want to start it up here. We're going to go through the uh, presentations by these are the, the various Westchester County organizations. They have three minutes um, and that's not a lot of time, but they're, again, they're going to be in our breakout sessions and you can uh, dig into them a little deeper once you get into the breakout sessions. Uh, you'll have two opportunities for the breakout sessions. One will be for 
um, you know, the first 15 minutes and then there will be a second one. So you can, you can go to two different ones and get information or whatever you want to do. Uh, the second one, we're going to kind of leave a little open-ended. The monitors uh, may uh, peel off and uh, go, go to their work, but we'll keep it open for uh, la past the 15 minutes um, if you'd like. And um, I'm going to start it off here. I believe each of the, uh, we did a little run through and each of the presenters here uh, is going to hand it off to the next person. Um, so I don't have to come back and we can make, make it move a little bit quicker. Um, so we're going to start it off with um, uh, Nina Orville, who is just, uh, uh, just recently appointed um, the executive director uh, she was selected after a, a, a very long process, a very tough process with so many, um, you know, environmental leaders here in uh, Westchester. Um, but uh, Nina is a good friend of mine. She and I um, worked on uh, the Southern Westchester Energy Action Consortium. We merged with NWEAC to create Sustainable Westchester. Um, and I think this would be a good time to thank Sustainable Westchester for everything they did. They came in and filled a space that was uh, deeply needed um, here in the county. And I can't, uh, can't think, I am also, I sit on the board, so I have full transparency. Um, I won't go on too much about it, but that is a fantastic organization uh, with their uh, uh, community choice aggregation is really a game changer here in Westchester for the residents. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm so thrilled to, to be with you here today. This is such an exciting opportunity for us all to share the work that we've been doing around the county and find new ways to, to collaborate and to accelerate the amazing progress that we have already been making up to this point in time. So um, Sustainable Westchester, I believe is unique in New York State as a nonprofit environmental organization whose members are municipalities. And we um, elevate and leverage the unique role that municipalities play, including, of course, the environmental, the municipal environmental committees in achieving our common sustainability, environmental justice, and climate goals. And um, together we've already accomplished a lot. So Pete mentioned the Westchester Power Program through which over 115,000 households are receiving electricity. It's the first program of its type in New York State. We've supported the development of almost 30 megawatts of solar through Solarize Westchester and our community solar programs. We're helping municipalities throughout the county help their residents remove materials from the waste stream through our Recycle Right program. We're supporting the transition to clean heating and cooling for buildings throughout the county. And there's a lot more of that that is coming. It's critically important work. We're helping to build a more robust EV charging station network throughout the county. And we're launching a lot of innovative pilot programs that um, I know uh, quite a few of you have been hearing about. And the objectives of those programs often relate to making our electricity grid more efficient. So Sustainable Westchester helps our municipalities and their communities achieve their own goals. And um, we've been able to, to see that really clearly through NYSERDA's current Clean Energy Communities Program. Um, for instance, there are over 45 clean energy community campaigns that are currently in development or that have launched. So there's a lot more to do. We're only successful in partnership with our communities and we're eager to continue to partner with you to deliver more programs that can help you achieve your goals. We're particularly committed to bringing green jobs and new investment into Westchester County to spur economic activity that benefits everybody and particularly communities that have historically been excluded. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Anne Jaffe Holmes, the Program Director of Federated Conservationists of Westchester County. Thank you all. That is so sweet. And what a wonderful start to my day. Thank you all. And you know what? You just 
did all the introduction for me. So I'm just going to add this to what Peter said. FCWC has realized in recent years over time that um, there are more voices to be brought to the table on the environment than have been in the past in Westchester County in particular. And so our current focus really is on environmental justice communities, the people who are bearing the heaviest brunt of environmental uh, uh, problems and climate problems, and also the, the youth voice. So we're very, very proud of our student network leaders. They're awesome people uh, and, they're, and they're, they're running a breakout this afternoon. I hope you guys will uh, consider joining if you wanna learn how to advocate effectively. These young people, they know how to do it. The other thing is we're very delighted to be working with the city of Mount Vernon and the huge number of fantastic people that are doing amazing community organizing and community building around the environment in their city. Watch Mount Vernon. It's headed for a real renaissance. So that's all I want to say. I'm going to end a little early. So I, and I get to pass the baton to wonderful Nadia Hall of uh, the Environmental Leader Leaders Learning Alliance and also T-Town. Right, Nadia? <laughs> Thanks, Ann. Uh, so I'm Nadia Hall, and I am the community environmentalist at T-Town Lake Reservation, which is a nature preserve and environmental edu education center, kind of at the cusp of Austin, Cortland, Newcastle, and Yorktown up in northern Westchester. And so there we work to create a community of environmental stewards in a number of ways. We get the the good fortune to work in the schools and local communities on things like food scrap recycling projects, but also uh, I manage a group called the Environmental Leaders Learning Alliance in partnership with Anne at FCWC to work specifically with uh, municipalities and those CACs and that whole long list, laundry list that Peter was talking about at the beginning, along with the planning boards and whoever else is willing to join us that advises a town on environmental matters. And so we do that through technical trainings with a wonderful system of partners. We have both at the state through the DEC as well as local expertise to bring uh, that environmental education to these groups and to also foster the connection between them so that they're able to make intermunicipal uh, decisions and communication and, and advance their projects together looking at a the environment as a regional construct and issue versus just these sort of siloed artificial boundaries. And so with that, I promise not to take up too much more time and I will turn it over to Janet Harkham, the co-chair of the Climate Reality Project Westchester and president at the Friends of Hilltop Hanover Farm and Environmental Center. Um, I'm gonna split my three minutes into one and a half. So the first th uh, is the Climate Reality Project Westchester chapter. Climate Reality Project is a national um, organization with international reach. We, it has trained 31,000 climate leaders around the world. You can do the training. It's free. I encourage you to do it. There's one coming up in October that has a global focus. It gives you, uh, the whole purpose is to train on the realities of climate and educate and scale solutions. There is a New York State um, chapter um, New York State Coalition of Chapters, and we're doing a giant retreat on the at the end of the month. If you want to join our chapter, you can uh, join the retreat, which is going to have Dr. Michael Mann and Catherine Hayhoe and a number of unbelievable speakers. I encourage you to join. I will put that information in the chat. Um, it, Westchester chapter does what climate reality does, which is we're trying to help scale solutions and give presentations and educate ourselves and others. Um, Hilltop Hannibal Farm and Environmental Center is Westchester's best kept secret. It's a organic farm. Westchester County owns an organic farm and most people do not even know it exists. It, if you go up there on a beautiful day, you can see New York City, you see the watershed. It's unbelievable. There's um, the mission of the organization um, is to, I'm going to read it out loud because it's actually good. Well, basically we educate and we give food away and we gave 12,000 pounds of food away last year to food pantry partners. We gave 15,000 pounds away the year before. Um, we are interested in sustainable agriculture and environmental stewardship and educating the community and having, um, you know, it be a demonstration site for all things sustainability for Westchester County. We need help, we need volunteers, we need support. And I really encourage you to get up there and get some food, buy food. There's an online market and it's really beautiful. And it's a great group of people and a good place to visit. Um, miles of hiking trails. It's really, really something you should look at and, and go picnic. It's really something that is 
um, underutilized and a wonderful place. So um, I encourage you to look into Hilltop Hanover Farm and Environmental Center also. The end. It's wonderful to um, follow you. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's so excited to join you all today. And I want to thank all of our amazing hosts for convening this really wonderful event. Um, many of you may know me back from 2016 when I served as CEC coordinator for all Westchester County local governments for about four years. Um, as with the first round of the CEC program, CEC coordinators provide technical support and guidance to local governments um, on this program that is designed to help you and your constituents save money through clean energy and energy efficiency actions. Um, the Clean Energy Communities Program, managing that program in the Hudson Valley, that's one of the roles that I play at HVRC. I'm also the Deputy Executive Director. Now, if um, this program is designed, as I said, specifically for local government, so if you haven't already reached out to HVRC's CEC coordinators, please do so, um, because our goal is to help your community find its path toward clean energy communities leadership across 24 high impact actions in the leadership round. So there's a lot of options available. Um, HVRC is also available to support communities with the New York State Climate Smart Communities Program, which is an action in the CEC program, but that's not all that HVRC does. HVRC is one of nine regional councils in New York State and one of over 600 nationally. We support our member counties and municipalities across a variety of programmatic areas, including economic development, water quality planning, and hosting regional platforms for the Mid-Hudson Regional Sustainability Coalition and the Materials Management Working Group. Um, on the economic development end, we help local governments and eligible nonprofits access EDA um, funds through the EDA Partnership Planning Program. And soon we'll be launching a new study on the economic impact of COVID-19 pandemic with funding from the EDA and the Congressional CARES Program. The study will include uh, the, a team of economic recovery coordinators who will be providing assistance to regional businesses throughout the region. On our water quality end, we, um, we're going to expand beyond providing education and outreach on water quality planning and stormwater management um, through this new initiative uh, that's called the Drinking Water Source Protection Program. HVRC will assist regional communities to protect source water through a newly proposed framework. And this program will include mapping of new potential source water sites, existing water sources and land uses, and potential contamination threats to reservoirs. Um, but enough about how HVRC can help you reach your goals. Um, when, we, uh, when I next see you during one of our two breakout sessions, I'll be joined by my fellow CEC coordinator, Anila Cherian, and Westchester's very own Mayor Nicola Armacos. Many of you uh, may not know this, or, or maybe you all do, um, but the village of Hastings on Hudson has the very proud distinction of being the very first community in the state to pass the 5,000 point threshold under the CEC leadership round. Congratulations to Mayor Armacost and her team. Um, we look forward to sharing uh, answers and our experiential learnings on the CEC uh, and, C and Climate Smart Communities programs during the workout sessions. Thank you. Now I'm gonna pass it off to Julie Teague, president of the League of Conservation Voters. Good morning, thank you. I'm Julie Tai, I'm president of the New York League of Conservation Voters. Um, we are a little bit different in that uh, from the folks who have spoken so far in that we are a statewide environmental advocacy organization that fights for clean air, clean water, renewable energy, and open space through uh, political action, which makes us a, a bit different from most environmental groups from that perspective. Um, in addition to working on state and federal issues, uh, we also are active local issues where we have chapters, um, including Westchester, New York City, Long Island, and the Capital Region. Um, and we're very proud to partner with many uh, folks who are here today. In particular, we do a lot of work in Westchester with Sustainable Westchester, uh, our friends at the Riverkeeper and Save the Sound uh, on both state and, and local issues. Um, so we are a little bit different in that we evaluate, we endorse and we elect candidates. Um, so we wanna take all the work that everybody is doing and make sure that our elected officials are actually making them happen. Um, so we do that by establishing policy agendas. We then evaluate uh, what's happened after we've done advocacy to help get new laws enacted and policies enacted. Um, and then we, we ask candidates what they're gonna do about a whole bunch of environmental issues. We use our questionnaires to help leverage a lot of the work that you're all doing into real action. Um, and we hold people accountable for that. Um, 
you know, things like uh, we've been including where where folks are in their climate smart communities um, certifications as part of our endorsement process so that we're really sort of pulling the policy into what we're expecting elected officials to do once they're in office. Um, we've also been asking them lately um, uh, using our education fund, which we use to educate, engage, and empower New Yorkers to be effective advocates for the environment. We've been using that program to ask uh, municipalities how they're doing on electrifying their transportation sector so that we can make sure that we are making progress towards moving to uh, a clean transportation fund. Um, you know, we, we, we often work with partners like Sustainable Westchester on educational forums. Um, and work right now, for example, we're partnering on some EV work and we've done uh, forums together to talk about how we're going to move to a clean energy future in a post Indian point world, uh, which we held last year in person, you may recall, it seems only like 20 years ago, but really it was just late last February um, to talk about, about moving to clean energy. Um, we also educate voters and encourage civic engagement by holding candidate forums. For example, we held one sadly by Zoom, but it was engaging nonetheless uh, for the, the seat to replace Congresswoman Nita Lowy. Um, and I envision that we're gonna be holding more candidate forums this year. So we make sure that candidates are including the environment as part of the work that they're doing um, when they're running for office and keeping it top of mind. Um, we know that that's happening more and more. We're seeing more candidates include climate action and clean water as part of the platforms that they're running on. And I think that's a testament to all the work that all of you do all year round, um, as well as the fact that voters are caring about these issues uh, more than ever before. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm the executive director of Groundwork Hudson Valley. We are a community-based um, environmental organization based out of Yonkers, New York. Um, we focus our programming around three primary areas. The first being around uh, sustainability education. So we have a, a really fun and unique um, floating environmental education center on the Hudson River in downtown Yonkers. Um, and the purpose of that is really to educate and empower our residents to understand not only about the environmental challenges that um, disproportionately impact certain neighborhoods in our communities versus others, but also to um, help folks realize how they can be part of the solution to improve the environmental conditions of their neighborhoods. We also have a really, really strong focus on youth leadership and employment. Um, so we employ uh, Yonkers youth in all of the projects that we do um, providing first time jobs and environmental restoration, both in and around Yonkers and Westchester County, and also in partnership with um, the National Park Service and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So exposing young <clears throat> and diverse ranges of young people to careers in the environmental field is a, a very big focus of the work that we do. And finally, the last piece of work is, is really around transforming um, and improving um, the environmental conditions of our neighborhoods. So we have three major initiatives that we're working on now. Um, the first is the uh, Sawmill River Coalition. Um, we were the nonprofit that worked to build the initial coalition uh, to daylight the Sawmill River in downtown Yonkers. Um, and that work was, um, was completed many years ago, but um, the work of the coalition moves on. So in partnership with County Legislator Mary Jane Shimsky and river towns up and down the sawmill, um, we are working collectively to restore the conditions of the river and ultimately reach a, um, a watershed wide plan that, um, that traverses all municipal boundaries. Um, the second big project that we're working on is the Yonkers Greenway. So working to promote sustainable transportation solutions um, where we're working to restore um, the old Putnam uh, rail spur, which was actually part of the railroad that uh, many of you know as the South County and North County Trail. Um, so when that is complete, we will have a two mile walking and biking path to connect New York City to downtown Yonkers once again. And finally, we are increasingly working around um, addressing climate injustice issues. So we are mapping the neighborhoods in and around Yonkers 
um, and uh, that are uh, going to be suffering the most disproportionate impacts from extreme heat and flooding. We're very excited to work with the Federated Conservationists of Westchester County, Sustainable Westchester, and others to think about how we can expand this work to other cities across the county. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Bridget. Um, and thanks everybody for including us in this great event today. Um, so save the sound, you know, the mission's in the name. Um, but uh, in addition to our focus on protecting Long Island Sound and its rivers, um, we also work on restoring ecosystems within the Sound region and um, addressing climate mitiga mitigation um, and adaptation needs um, within the Long Island Sound region. And we also preserve endangered lands. So um, we've been around for 40 years. Uh, our main office, our headquarters with most staff is in New Haven, Connecticut. But since 2014, we've had an office in Mamaroneck. We're actually, many years ago, we also had an office in Mamaroneck, um, with Na which Nancy Seligson was involved with. But um, right now we have uh, about eight people um, in that New York office. And I wanna talk about two things um, that we focus on real quickly today because um, we do a lot of different things. We have a lot of expertise on staff, but in our New York office, we mostly focus on water issues. So I'm gonna talk about water quality and water quantity. Um, around water quality, we do a lot of work on pollution, water pollution, that's our bread and butter, finding it and fixing it. Um, we have a really robust water quality monitoring program that includes um, citizen volunteers as well as expert staff, scientists. And we are going to be moving within the next couple of months to a new space in Larchmont where we're going to open a more professional, publicly accessible lab where we will be able to take in um, samples um, in partnership with municipal communities. So we'll be able to um, expand from our basic annual monitoring that we do um, in tributaries all along the Westchester coastline to um, partnering with communities on areas of concern that they have. Um, we also have a really robust um, messaging and reporting part of our work. So um, we think it's really important to continue to engage residents and make them aware that really the water is a mirror of how we are living on the land and that their actions you know, directly impact whether or not their beach is open or their shellfishing um, beds are closed. So we publish reports um, in alternating years. We do a beach water quality report and then um, an ecological water quality report. And we also have created a tool, I'll put it in the chat, um, the Sound Health Explorer, where we take all of this water quality data, both what we collect, but also other communities, and we publish it for all of you to access. And it really gets into the nitty gritty of what are your local water quality conditions, why you might have pollution, and then what you can do, um, specific actions to get involved. So the other thing I wanna address briefly is water quantity. So we also work a lot on stormwater issues, flooding, living shorelines and coastal restoration. Um, we have a program of um, engineers and planners who can do green infrastructure, dam removals, watershed planning, um, shellfish restoration. So that's a whole nother capacity that we're um, focused on growing in New York. I'll leave it at that, thank you. And now I'll pass it on to um, Jeremy Turson, who is the Legislative Advocacy Manager and Community Partnerships um, Program Representative from Riverkeeper. Thank you so much, Tracy. It's really great to be with everyone this morning. Um, so Riverkeeper is based in Ossining, uh, and uh, we work to protect the Hudson River uh, all the way from the Battery uh, up the Mohawk River and all the way to Lake Tier of the Clouds and the Adirondacks. Uh, and we have some uh, one big event that's coming up on May 1st, and registration opens for the Riverkeeper Sweep um, on May, uh, sorry, today. Uh, and the sweep is on May 1st, and we're aiming to have close to 100 uh, shoreline cleanup sites, tree plantings, and other events across the entire watershed. Uh, we had to move it around last year because of, uh, because of uh, the COVID-19 crisis, but this year we're hoping to, that we can get everyone out uh, with their families and friends uh, to help clean up our river and our tributaries. 
Another thing uh, we do every single year is Captain John Lipscomb patrols the Hudson River uh, all the way uh, from the Battery around the East River uh, all the way up to Utica. And we only started patrolling the Mohawk River a few years ago. And so we're starting to build our upriver program uh, and, and like Save the Sound, we do monitoring of water quality. And we have all of those uh, results from each uh, season we test up on our website. Uh, another interesting thing we're up to in Westchester County is we are working in Cortland uh, to remove several obsolete dams to restore glass eel uh, and herring uh, uh, passage in the tributaries uh, on what's known as Furnace Brook, but we are now trying to restore the indigenous name, which is the uh, Jamawissa Creek. Uh, and one dam has been brought down. Uh, there are more to bring down and uh, we are working with our state and federal representatives to bring funding to bear uh, to bring these dams uh, down across the region of which there are 1600 barriers on the Hudson River estuary uh, alone. Uh, we also work on source water protection. Uh, there are funds available within the state environmental protection fund and also the Clean Water Infrastructure Act for source water protection planning for municipalities uh, and for counties. Um, and one of the ways that uh, you know, we do this is we can look at um, peak skill, for example, uh, has uh, many unprotected class C streams that go into their uh, watershed. Uh, and uh, our good friend, Senator Pete Harkham has a bill that he's carried S4162 uh, which is a stream protection legislation that would help communities like Peekskill protect their water supplies. And I think I'm out of time. So I will pass it on to Danny Glazer uh, to continue on. The Green Business Partnership was founded in 2009 as a public-private partnership with the Business Council of Westchester and Westchester County government. So we're now 12 years old and the Green Business Partnership is a mission-driven nonprofit membership organization that awards official green business certification and fosters a thriving green business community inside and outside of Westchester. Our mission is to engage, educate and empower organizational and staff leaders and staff to accelerate sustainable business, a critical step toward ensuring a future where all people and communities have equitable access to a safe, clean, healthy and nourishing environment. The Green Business Partnership has more than 160 organizational members and 65 has, have achieved green business certification. The program features an easy to use online dashboard that guides organizations step by step through the process of incorporating sustainable practices into operations and measuring the impacts of those changes. We focus on seven key areas organizational commitment, energy, transportation, land use, water, waste and recycling, green purchasing, as well as refrigerants. We're in the process of adding real-time energy and indoor air quality metrics to the platform, as well as integrating with Energy Star portfolio manager so we can allow for benchmarking. While large corporations are expected to set targets and report on greenhouse gas emissions, small to medium-sized businesses have been slower to engage in system-wide sustainability measures, often due to lack of time, staffing, and cash flow. The GBP program provides a pathway for small to medium-sized businesses to benefit from measuring their carbon footprint and making improvements. A few of our certified members, several are here today actually, um, include the Hendrick Hudson Free Library in Montrose, the Blue Pig Ice Cream in Croton, Greenberg Nature Center, T-Town, Lake Reservation, 12 locations of the West Mid Medical Group, Yonkers Tennis Center, and Purchase College. So you can see we have quite an array of the types of organizations who we work with. We are working with Sustainable Westchester. We have a meeting tomorrow to offer the Green Business Partnership Program to Westchester municipalities. We will be reaching out to you to learn about the best way to engage the businesses in your community and, and assist those of you who are participating in the NYSERDA Clean Energy Communities Program um, or any other similar state program, Climate Smart. 
The business sector can play a significant role in helping to achieve climate goals in your communities. And often that sector is kind of left out. So we're here to, to change that. We welcome you to stop by and meet our team. Our whole team will be in the breakout room later. And I'm happy to introduce Emily McGraw, Program Co Coordinator of Planning Westchester to continue the program. Hi, um, wow, this is really great. I see so many familiar names and faces and lots of whom I've worked with on Planting Westchester. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Millie McGraw. I work for the county and in that position I am co-coordinator of Planting Westchester. The other co-coordinator of this exciting, innovative and program is the magnificent Nikki Coddington. Thank you, Nikki. Um, so Planting Westchester, what is it? Uh, Planting Westchester provides, or rather soon will provide people who live in the county with an easy to follow comprehensive resource on how to plant and maintain everything. Um, and through GIS mapping, we'll connect people from around the county so that you all can learn and grow from one another. Uh, phase one is an educational website chocked full of everything one would want to know about growing and maintaining trees and plants. It's an easy to follow toolkit with a local bent to it. The emphasis is on addressing issues that face the county, climate change, food security, heat islands, biodiverse habitat. And what's gonna be covered on the website? Well, we divided that into eight topic areas. So I'll just read those. Backyard vegetables and fruits, combating invasives, community gardens, container gardens, native plants, planting by water, soil health, and trees. Um, so say you wanna start a vegetable garden, you'll be able to go to the Backyard Vegetables and Fruits page and learn about how to determine how to site your garden, the size of your garden, when to plant, what to plant, how much sun do you need, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you can then hop over to the Soil Health page to learn about why soil health matters, how to get your soil tested, how to amend your soil, et cetera, et cetera. These pages are sort of geared towards um, newbies, you know, people who are just learning, but also there's plenty of information on the sites too for experts as well. Um, close to a hundred volunteers, thank you, have spent many an hour developing some text, but mainly carefully curating resources, videos, articles, books, other websites, um, et cetera. And, you know, many of the groups that I see here now um, have put together some of the guidelines that are amplified on this site. So for instance, just to name one of many, um, the folks from the town of Mount, Mount Pleasant here, and they put together a great list of native plants that developers must use, and that's gonna be on the site. Phase two of Planting Westchester is to map on the county's great GIS system, all the current and exist, current existing projects um, which will include information about the project and how to contact the folks who did the project. It'll be easy to search. So say for instance, you wanna start a pollinator pathway in your community or a tree drive to go on the GIS system, see who in the county has done something similar. And then you can talk to that person. You can learn from them. You can see what worked, what didn't work. There's no point in reinventing the wheel. I'm the last presentation. Thank you all very much. Thank this you, Millie. Day. Very excited about planting Westchester. You know, the idea, you know, um, is, uh, you know, about, um, you know, climate mitigation and sequestration of, uh, you know, our carbon as much as possible. It's based kind of based on the Million Tree Campaign, uh, but we added, wanted to add other components, specifically community gardens to it. And uh, Millie and Nikki have just really run with it and they've uh, herded all these uh, wonderful volunteers together and it's, an, and it's a very exciting opportunity. I, um, I wanted to make a couple more mentions um, you know, there's, there's, there's three organizations that are not represented here at all today, and they're very important for all the work that we do. Uh, number one is NYSERDA. There's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot to be gathered from uh, NYSERDA. They have a lot of uh, grants and, uh, you know, ways to save money uh, with residents, municipalities, and otherwise. And then there's also Con Ed. Um, they too, if you have an electric vehicle, and I recommend everybody have one electric vehicle in your in your uh, driveway, your garage, um, 
They have great programs, Smart Charge uh, for that. And then there's uh, New York Power Authority. Um, NIPA is who we get our electricity from. They also have some great programs. Um, I also wanted to just make a, a announcement that uh, Westchester County, uh, we are submitting uh, this Friday uh, to be certified for a climate smart community. Um, very exciting, uh, uh, Harry uh, Brussel, who's been working with me here and many other interns over the years. Uh, we finally got it together and we are submitting and we expect to uh, uh, get our certification. One of a few counties that uh, are certified. It's a little more difficult for a county, especially one our size. Um, I also just want to again say thank you to Ann Jaffe Holmes. Happy birthday, Ann. And I also want to say thank you to Maria and uh, her team, um, uh, Sustainable Westchester team and the FCW uh, have really done a lot to pull this together. Um, and now we're going to go into um, what I've been uh, euphemistically calling speed dating. So we're going to go through all the municipalities. You only have two minutes. Uh, but again, I keep stressing this, there's going to be time in the breakout sessions for people to dig down. You can also add, I see a lot of people adding things and adding links and whatnot in the chat, and that's fantastic. Um, but we're going to, we, we'll have a slide up and um, we expect uh, everybody to be prepared so we don't waste a lot of time. So um, take it away, Ardsley, please, Ida. Ardsley in the house. <laughs> Good morning. Can I, am I? Um, I guess I'm, you're on, Ida. Thank, thank you so you. much. So good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Ida Capsis, and I represent Ardsley CAC. As with our very um, first year, we're building on that foundation, um, and that foundation is connecting with people in our community and with you. So here, I see 200 plus collaborators to change things in Ardsley and around the globe for human behavior and decisions. It's a pleasure to be here. So we use one umbrella to define our approach. It's called Ardsley Can by 2030. And I'm gonna add some links in the chat here so you can poke around now and later um, and as, I, as I chat here. Um, the Ardsley Can leverages an acronym and it's for C-A-N. So here, let me just put this in for everyone. Whoops, let me just chat. Oh, I'll do it in a second. Um, the C is for a reduction of CO2 equivalent emissions by 50% by 2030, A is for acting sustainably, and N is for neighbor by neighbor. So in parallel with A and N, um, we launched the Pollinator Pathway Program too. So we've hosted many Zoom sessions, we now have free garden consults all around the village, and more, lots of ways to create impact. And if you can handle more Zoom, we welcome you too to sign up for our programs. So we have three principal objectives. We want to measure and reduce emissions to hit the original CLCPA targets using ever improving tools. And I'm happy to talk about those tools if you like. Um, establish and advance our village's position in NYSERDA's clean energy and DEC's climate smart communities. And engage the community for reduction of their carbon footprint. And that includes resilience, adaptation, and many of the original charter practices of CACs such as open space inventory. And finally, Ardsley Can frames policy for our board. So we've recently passed two resolutions um, and for our policy work, many of us uh, are being helped by you with the heavy lift and you know who you are, so we thank you. Um, we, our advances are really from a team of what I call human pollinators um, and we work our passions. Our core and ex uh, extended teams practice open dialogues um, on what works and what doesn't work for us and that keeps us going. And then finally, I just wanna say our recent success is segmented e-lists. So we really have gotten to know who we're working with and we reach them based on their interests and we manage those lists. So our challenge is to use these successes to build what I call new better. Um, so build new better, building on all this great stuff that's happening at the federal level. Thank you so much. Okay, start the clock now. <laughs> I am, uh, good morning, happy Earth Month. Um, Thank you to all of the amazing organizers of today's event and to all of you for the amazing work you're doing. I'm Midge Iorio, Executive Director of Bedford 2030, and I'm speaking on behalf of the town of Bedford about creating a community of climate activists. So what was our challenge? Bedford passed two climate action plans, one in 2010 and one last year. And our challenge was, and still is, to not have those plans sit on a shelf but instead to create a community of climate activists to tackle our climate action goals, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and protect natural resources. So what's worked? Well, first creating a community-wide movement, Bedford 2030 recently rebranded re as Bedford, I mean, Bedford 2020 recently rebranded as Bedford 2030 
climate action now that everyone can be a part of, organizing the movement around community-wide goals, specific measurable community-wide goals, measuring our progress, and sharing and celebrating our community achievements far and wide. Growing the movement with collaboration and partnership among community stakeholders, um, Bed for 2030, the town board, the conservation board, town department heads, community organizations with like-minded missions, civic groups, students, schools, and houses of worship. So far and wide partnerships. Next, bringing community members into the movements with programs they can relate to, but with a longer term goal of getting them to make more impactful actions. Of course, we want everyone to invest in a new heat pump, but having a range of solu solutions um, makes it accessible to all. Make it relevant. Not everybody is motivated instantly by reducing. Am I done? No. Wow. All right. So it's a big topic for two minutes. Um, so just I'm going to quickly wrap up. So greenhouse gas emissions relates to air quality, jobs, cost savings. So make it relevant. Create a community of ambassadors make the town modeled behaviors we want, neighbor to neighbor um, um, endorsement and communication celebration and community pride. So um, I'm going to be in the breakout sessions. If anyone wants, has questions or ideas on this topic, um, welcome the discussion. Thank you, Midge. Thank you very much. Briarcliff Manor, you're on. Hi, I'm Padma. I represent the Briarcliff Sustainability Committee. We are fairly new here compared to the, all your other awesome groups over here. Um, and we are very excited to be part of this uh, group, which is doing so much of good. Thank you so much to Sustainable Westchester for reaching out to help us get involved. At Briarcliff's <clears throat> Sustainability Committee, we started out uh, two or three years ago following the template, following very closely the template of other um, neighboring communities like Newcastle, uh, Croton, uh, Pleasantville, and Arsening. But since January, we've been working on the Energy Smart Homes Initiative with Lauren at uh, Sustainable Westchester and with Green Austin. We've now participated in um, three, three very um, uh, really uh, exciting webinar events, which um, I think it generated quite a lot of uh, excitement in the community. And um, it's generated, I think, uh, the latest since the latest webinar, I think there's uh, been more than 15 um, assessments, which people have reached out to the contractors to, um, uh, it, to move forward uh, energy efficient initiatives for their homes. So we've been focusing on uh, geothermal uh, air source and um, uh, heat source, uh, uh, air source heat pumps, um, community solar, other initiatives like this. So we are also working on bringing Briarcliff into uh, you know, becoming a member of the CEC. We're looking forward to bringing a lot of environmental uh, energy to our community in Briarcliff. And um, thank you again to Sustainable Westchester. Thank you so much. And our next community is Bronxville. So we have Ellen Edwards, please. Hi, I'm Ellen Edwards. I'm the chair of the Bronxville Green Committee, and I've been asked to talk about our two long running programs, Take Back Day and the Bronxville Giving Garden. Take Back Day is held in the spring and the fall, and it's a drive through event that provides residents with a chance to donate items for reuse and recycling. We collect paper for shredding, electronics, gently used clothes, and bedding for animal shelters. We work closely with the Department of Public Works and volunteers from the Green Committee help man various vendor sites along a short through road behind Village Hall, which is also where the DPW is located. The event runs from 10 to 1 on Saturday mornings. Controlling traffic is sometimes an issue um, since cars line up well before the event. The paper shredder is the most popular service and once the shredder is full, activity slows down considerably. We promote the event through the online local newspaper with emails and flyers. The village staff helps promote it with um, several village-wide e-blasts. The county lists the shredder on the website, which tends to attract people from out of town. They use the shredder, but don't care about the other services provided and aren't able to take full advantage. And during the event, we hand out flyers about recycling and assign a photographer. 
Take Back Day is a popular, well-suited event to collecting large quantities of a few simple items. In the controlled chaos of 300 cars driving through in three hours, there's no time to sort through bags to eliminate items we can't accept. The success of the program depends on volunteers who enjoy participating in an event that just takes a few hours. And of course, it can't happen without the DPW. Oh, no time. Um, the Giving Garden is a community-centered garden. All the produce we raise is donated to two local food banks. It's also a gathering place for school children and volunteers where they can discover the joy of tending plants and growing food. Um, it was proposed in 2016 and we're about to start our fifth growing season. Everything we donate is organically grown. Thank you. Hi, I'm speaking of that the local waterfront revitalization project, which is a Cortland Buchanan initiative. Uh, together, we have the longest Hudson River coastline in Westchester. Um, the area is a mix of industrial and recreation housing. Um, it includes Indian Point to the north and George's Island to the south. In the middle is the hamlet of Verplank. Um, the LWRP did a survey. Um, most of the participants in the survey wanted such things as a river walk picnic areas, natural areas, summer concerts, uh, kayak launch, and bike paths. There was also um, considerable differences between people in some wanted uh, passive recreation and things like that, but others wanted to have our industrial base, which we're losing Indian Point, replaced by something um, which would bolster the tax base. Um, in, also in Verplank, there's a proposal for the Hudson River Discovery Center, which would be a, uh, a discovery center for the Hudson River about um, what goes on um, environmentally in the river. And it would be based on the extensive brick making and ice uh, gathering that was done here in the earlier century. And we're very happy with that idea. My name is Lindsay Auden. I'm the chair of the Croton Sustainability Committee. Croton is a small village within the town of Cortland. We have about 8,000 people. Since 2009, our sustainability committee has cutting, been cutting the carbon footprints for both municipal facilities and in our community. Last year, we achieved silver certification under the state's Climate Smart Community Program. We also previously held the record for performing the most high impact actions in the state's Clean Energy Community Program. In 2017 and 2018, we upgraded all of our lighting to LED, including all of our lighting in our buildings, streetlights, parks, and parking lots. Before starting the lighting work in our buildings, we used a corridor in one of them to test a dozen different ways to convert lighting to LED so we could see which was the most cost effective and acceptable. All the lighting in our buildings was then switched to LED based on that experience. We published our findings and NYSERDA made it into a YouTube video. In 2020, on the rooftop of our DPW garage, we installed a 302 kilowatt community solar project at no cost to the village. Through careful planning and negotiation, we also got the roof repaired at no cost to the village. We are now collecting $25,000 a year in rent for use of our rooftop. Part of that money goes toward other measures to cut greenhouse gas emissions. And 51 Croton residents, 17% of them low income, now get the 10% community solar discount. We're now working on a much larger community solar project. It's a 4.7 megawatt solar canopy system over our parking lot at the Croton train station. It's gonna take over a year to complete, but then we'll provide about a half a million dollars a year in rent to the village, plus a 10% discount for all the power used by our municipal facilities. We signed the leasing agreement last month and construction work will start in about um, over the summertime. And I think my time is about up. So I thank you very much for your time and attention. Hi. Um, so Dobbs Ferry is a hotbed of activity um, around sustainability issues, so much so that I was lobbied as to what I was going to say today. So the, the two things that we landed on were one, um, our Zero Waste Committee, which is a subcommittee of our sustainability task force. We have an extensive composting education and composting effort at our elementary school led by Sarah Solidi. We also have a municipal food scrap drop off where we get over a thousand pounds per week of food scraps um, led by Jen Murphy with a great cooperation from our DPW. Um, second, we have a wonderful conservation advisory board under the leadership of Sue Galloway. 
um, is in the process of reimagining Chauncey Park, a 14 acre village park, providing forested walking accessibility between neighborhoods. Um, last autumn, it planted 65 shrubs um, through the Trees for Chips program, and this spring we'll plant 75 more. Chauncey is now a Sawmill River Coalition stewardship site, and you can visit it by signing up for the Great Sawmill River Cleanup on April 24th. Um, there are other invasive removal and habitat rest rest uh, restoration work as well. Um, but I do want to talk about some challenges that we have. Um, one is we have, we are, Dobbs Ferry is blessed with wonderful volunteer leadership. Um, you may know the names Anila Cherian and Nina Orville. Well, these are two of our great volunteer leaders who have now been stolen by other organizations um, like Sustainable Westchester. Um, and they're hard to replace and they all often land on people like me. And unfortunately, when we have efforts like Climate Smart Community um, recertification, which requires sustained efforts over time, volunteers like me are too flaky. And wonder, <laughs> thankfully, we have gotten our village staff to now step up and, and take on some of those roles. So those, that's one of the things that I want to thank our Dobbs Ferry leadership um, in doing. And the first thing we did was we adopted New York Stretch. Um, that's it. Thanks. Um, so now let's hear from East Chester. And we have Peter, who's, hey. in, who's, uh, <laughs> who's representing the committee. Fortunately, we're far behind a lot of the other communities. Um, and that's one of our challenges is we have a very uh, climate change denying conservative uh, uh, community and um, it's but it's changing it's changing for the better our, our big um, victories if you will that we've had and successes and I think it's uh, kind of replicable uh, across other municipalities is our green medallion awards so we give these out every year um, we've done it for about 12 years now and uh, we give out one two three awards to either an organization or a, a business that has really stepped up and um, we give a nice bamboo um, you know, uh, plaque and, um, and it's been a, a big success. It also is, um, they've, the people that we give them to are the organizations, they've done good to get the award, but then they take it to that, that extra step. They feel, um, emboldened to really move it forward even farther. Um, and then our other one is, um, our green festival. So we do a small green festival. Um, when we get 150, 200 people, um, uh, promoting, you know, various, um, uh, you know, businesses or uh, organizations. We have NYSERDA and NYPA come in and visit and, uh, you know, talk and uh, we have music and it's a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, and those are our two biggest successes uh, besides the first community to have Sharrows on our road um, to create a bike route from the southern end of East Chester, which is very long to the northern end um, and keeping off uh, Route 22. And um, that's it. I'm done. Hi, I'm Robin Roki, a member of the Harrison Sustainability Committee. Our committee was formed two years ago in April 2019. It's structured as a citizens committee, which means uh, we have no government funding and no elected representatives as members. Although we have not met over the past year during the pandemic, we had a number of successes in our first year. We identified several areas of focus including implementation of the state's plastic bag ban and investigation of countywide programs such as the food scrap recycling in Westchester Tower. We have raised awareness of our new committee and our initiatives at town public events. We collected names of citizens interested in joining the committee and hearing from the committee. We solicited feedback on possible initiatives to identify areas of highest interest in town, such as composting and uh, drinking water concerns. And we had uh, a trash sorting game that was geared towards children and families. We had several successful initiatives around the state's plastic bag ban, which was due to go in effect uh, last March, 2020. We screened the movie Bag It at our library in January, 2020. We worked with the town to set a paper bag fee to encourage use of reusable bags. And we drop boxes around town for people to donate extra clean reusable bags for others in need of one to take. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Robin. And we're great to hear that you guys are getting started and you have friends here at Sustainable Westchester. So give us a shout. Right. 
um, Hastings on Hudson, please. And I think it's either Mary Lambert or Mayor Amherst. I'm 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 not sure if Mary's here. I can't see her in the in the thread. Um, Maria, I am standing in for Mary Lambert. Perfect. Uh, okay, she, perfect. She, Mary's in the Adirondacks. Lucky um, her. <laughs> and she has spotty Wi-Fi, but she has a ton of snow. So she <laughs> is happy wherever she is. And she is our amazing liaison to our Conservation Commission and our Climate Smart Communities and our Parks and Rec Commission. So she's, she's a powerhouse for us. I want to give a quick shout out to the people who are from Hastings who are on the call, uh, Haven, Andy, Sharon, Elisa, you're all amazing. You're all incredible. The groups that you are power, powering forward in the village are super important. Um, we are proud of a few achievements uh, uh, that we were able to get done despite COVID. Um, the first is, the, is reaching silver uh, under the CSC, the auspices of the CSC. We were very excited to be able to get to bronze and silver last year. And we also, as Carla very sweetly pointed out, are currently, and we know this is only for five minutes, you'll all be catching up with us soon, but we are the number one uh, clean energy community in New York state. And we got past that 5,000 point threshold. We also were able to uh, accomplish a bunch of policy initiatives. So we passed New York stretch, we passed CPACE financing, we passed a green concrete resolution, we have a green fleet policy, we have a green procurement policy and a bunch of other things. When you've got people uh, snuggled up at home without other things to do, you can actually get quite a lot done. And the final thing that we're really proud of is that this year we dedicated 150 acres of parkland out of 184 potential parcels, which is more than 86% of our um, open space. Uh, we're restoring Hillside Woods, Quarry Park, Riverview Park, and we have amazing groups like our Vine Squad and Protect uh, the Woods group that are moving everything forward. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chet Kerr from Irvington. Um, pleased to be with everybody here today. There's a lot going on in our community. I just want to mention a couple. We've just received bronze certification of the Climate Smart Community Program. We've recently amended our leaf blower law to include an outright ban on gas powered leaf blowers as of 2023, which is great. But what I've been asked to highlight today is our very successful pollinator pathway project here in Irvington, which is now spread across all the river towns. Um, it was launched in the fall of 2018. It's very much a bottoms up community based effort. Uh, our project mission is to engage and educate the community about pollinators and native plants and reducing pesticides promote public awareness about the crucial role that pollinators play and raise awareness about and preserve and protect open space and parks. When we launched our project three years ago, there was only one other community in Westchester, North Salem, that was even considering such a project. Today, there are over 60 communities in Westchester, Rockland, Putnam, and Dutchess counties with pollinator pathway projects. It's really, really taken off. And it's really taken off here in the river towns. There is now a solid network of folks working on these issues in Hastings, Dobbs Ferry, Ardsley, Irvington, Terrytown, um, Sleepy Hollow, and Nyack as well. A big part of our program is education. We've been running a very successful living classroom series to bring in speakers talking about topics of interest. We've been able to blend that with our wonderful O'Hara Nature Center here in Irvington by emphasizing how protection of pollinators advances a range of other environmental goals. What's really great about this project, it's empowering. It allows people and gives folks an opportunity to do something in their own yard that makes them feel like they're tackling the wider, the wider environmental challenges we're all dealing with. So it's a very, very effective program for on a range of environmental issues to get people engaged. So that's my report. I'm Kristen Anderson. I'm a member of the Larchmont Environmental Committee. Our most recent success was to pass the first complete gas powered leaf blower ban in the Northeast uh, effective this coming January. Um, gas powered leaf blowers are completely banned, no exceptions. Electric blowers are limited to spring cleanup in April and fall cleanup October 15th through December 15th. Um, as part of our implementation plan for this ban, we are putting 
on a public awareness campaign to show people the alternatives to gas powered leaf blowers, mainly mo mo mulching, mulch mowing and um, electric blowers. And as part of that, we are going to be putting in a green zone in one of our municipal parks. A green zone, for those who don't know, is a designated piece of land where no gas two-stroke engines are used as part of landscaping equipment. So no gas leaf blowers, uh, hedgers, trimmers, um, and in, it, in their place, electric leaf blowers and mulch mowing will be used. That's a program uh, developed by AGSA, the American Green Zone Alliance and Quiet Communities. Dan Mabe, who founded AGSA, is coming to Larchmont to set up our green zone and certify it and, um, and run workshops to show our residents and our professional landscape maintenance crews how to use these new techniques. And the green zone will become a demonstration area for how um, property can be maintained and look beautiful without gas powered leaf blowers. Um, so um, we thank Sustainable Westchester for sponsoring that project. They're sponsoring our green zone project. If anybody has questions about our gas power leaf blower ban, um, they can go on the Village of Larchmont uh, um, website on our homepage. There's a button. You can look at our code and um, how we passed the, the code. Um, we also plan to put together a, a, a toolkit for municipalities that want to pass codes like ours. Shout out to um, Irvington. We're glad to see they have a gas powered leaf blower ban too. Let's get everybody uh, banning gas powered leaf blowers. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks so much, Kristen. And Sustainable Westchester is thrilled to be a part of that with Lodge Fund. And if anyone else is interested in hearing more about um, a, the Green Zone or AGSA, they can also reach out to Sustainable Westchester. And I'm imagining someone on the team will put some contact information, please, uh, in the chat for everyone. And now we have Lewis Burrow and our very own Dan Welsh, who is also the program director uh, for Westchester Power. He is also um, part of the Lewis Borough town, uh, town Board and the Sustainability Advisory Committee. So take it away, Dan. Hi, so um, I'm putting on my other hat here <laughs> and uh, representing those committees. I'm liaison to a bunch of them, Sustainability, the CAC, Open Space, Bike Pedestrian. Uh, Lewisboro is an interesting place. We, we had a very strong emphasis on the sort of traditional environmentalism with uh, some of the earliest very strong wetlands protect, uh, protections. We had the earliest examples of cluster housing. We did a tremendous lot of work in open space and preserves, but probably historically we had avoided sort of the uh, more modern sense of sustainability. And, you know, we couldn't talk about climate change some years ago, uh, uh, but we did get into some of the programs through Sustainable Westchester. Uh, we were not in our committees like terribly systematic about things. I, I hear some of the other committees doing fantastic work in a very systematic way, but we were able to sort of bump from program to program and make some, some pretty significant progress. I should say our school district is probably an exception. They were very ahead of their, their time. So the one of the examples is, uh, I mean, we've been through Heat Smart and Solarize. Community Solar has been great in recent uh, times for raising the whole profile of sustainability. And we uh, made a lot of progress. I think we have like 180 people signed up for that. And it's really uh, uh, raised the profile of the whole effort in the town and among the among the residents because of those successes. I want to add uh, that uh, another item, and I'm kind of off script, but plastic bags was a big uh, uh, boost for us, and because we had a champion that really took it. And we had one of the most uh, aggressive laws of, of that kind. So I have to second uh, Rob Barron's uh, statement about uh, volunteers and um, and uh, and maybe uh, issue a, like a hope that that our municipality might consider sort of uh, allocating some staff time to some of this. So sorry, Mitch. Take it away. Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's great that everybody is together and it's amazing to hear all of the successes and 
and different communities moving forward. So I am the chair of the Town of Ameritech Sustainability Collaborative. We're getting pretty close to our 10 year anniversary. We're actually uh, an official component of the town and we report directly to the town board. And actually we are blessed with an annual budget. So our focus has always been policy simultaneously with projects. So minds and hands working together. The collaborative focuses on resilience, sustainability and the quality of life, but always with an eye on economics. Because as our residents repeatedly tell us, a program that is not economically sustainable will never be environmentally sustainable. Some of the quick highlights over the years include in 2012 and 13, we helped the town uh, first organize an ESCO for town facilities and then uh, went up the hill as it were and around the corner and helped convince the Unified School District to create an ESCO for upgrading of the, our schools in the area as well. 2014, uh, as a tri-municipal effort with the villages of Large Point of the Maranek, we established ourselves as a bike-friendly community. 2015, we were one of the first solarized members with 17, 72 new installs. 2017, a pioneer below 287 on food scrap recycling. 2018, started a healthy clubs and healthy yards program, which we then uh, extended to Wingsfoot, which was the uh, setting for last year's US Open. In 2019, we uh, were able as a tri-municipal effort to um, obtain a grant from the New York State for Department of DEC for a three-year Love Your Food program. John in Mount Kisco, are you back online? Uh, yes, I am. Perfect, thank you so much. Take it away. Okay, well, you know, the one of the main uh, main things we've been concentrating on is restoring our riparian areas uh, and, and our forests. Um, I know it, people look at Mount Kisco, they think that it's, uh, uh, they think it's a very, uh, it's a very good forest canopy, but we've been losing a lot over the past 10 years. Uh, so we've, uh, we've established no mow zones along our streams uh, and around our ponds. And that's been very, you know, very helpful. And uh, also this, uh, this year we're working again with uh, the Watershed Agricultural Council uh, to plant trees along our streams and around our ponds. And in addition to that, we've ordered several hundred uh, uh, seedlings uh, and saplings, which we're gonna be giving away at our Earth Day uh, celebration, which is gonna be on April 25th at Fountain Park uh, in Mount Kisco. 24th. 24th, I'm sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, is that is that it for you, John? Thank you, John. Uh, well, Thank there's you. just, there's so much else, but, uh, uh. Uh, but I'm more really interested to hear what other people are saying. So that's so great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, so I'm um, Greenberg. So Garrett, here you go. Thank you very much. Uh, in Green, town of Greenberg, we have a growing food scrap recycling program. Uh, we, we're launching community solar campaign through the Greenberg Nature Center soon. Uh, with respect to solar, we have no barriers to roof mounted solar installations, 100% administrative process. I do know one challenge we have, we do have uh, no approving mechanism for solar ground mount in several of our zoning districts in the town. Uh, I, I, in my look, it seems as if either the village or the town of Ossining have, have a really good model. So uh, we're gonna look into that. Uh, 2021, we were approved for NYSERDA's Clean Energy Communities Program. Uh, and that was attributed to our involvement with community choice aggregation, which is ongoing. Uh, Townwide LED light retrofit and our uh, involvement with Energy Improvement Corporation. We adopted PACE 2.0. Uh, in 2021, uh, battery energy storage has been on the town's radar quite a bit, and um, we're in the process of creating a local law. Um, a challenge there is just, you know, striking community character safety concerns with the energy needs and, you know, the, the, the good aspects of battery energy storage, which are a piece of the uh, sustainability puzzle. Uh, I would like to also note we did a pass a townwide tree law in 2020, which introduced tree canopy and environmental value as a metric for replacement planting. Just a couple uh, land use notes. 
in 2018 through 2020, we led a multi-jurisdictional uh, uh, complete streets effort on 119, and that plan is uh, land use based, but it leads to um, plans that we're working with New York State DOT to create a bike path along 119 from the new um, Mario Cuomo Bridge to the North South County Trailway. And also land use transportation planning. I'd like to note that our town um, prepared a sidewalk prioritization report. One of the uh, major needs we have in our community is uh, enhancing our sidewalk and pedestrian network. And that plan prioritizes $20 million of sidewalk expenditures over the next 12 years. It's a robust plan, lots of maps, and uh, Westchester County identified that as the first report of its kind that they've ever seen. Um, I think that's most of the things I wanted to highlight, so thanks for your time. Thank you so much, and um, we're sorry to see you go, and we're glad we could accommodate the change in your schedule, and thank you to Greenberg for, um, for actually um, upgrading to the green uh, Westchester Power uh, program this year. We were thrilled. So here we go now, Mount Pleasant. We have the Conservation Advisory Council and Stephen. Hi, uh, Stephen Cavi. I'm the uh, chair of the Conservation Advisory Council as Millie McGraw with Planting Westchester mentioned, um, uh, our CAC consolidated pamphlets and web links for native plants into a user-friendly resource with categories for different environmental conditions and habitat values. Part of this was driven by efficiencies as developers responded to our input on landscaping. So we created a native plant resource guide based in part on Doug Tallamy and other experts' conclusions that habitat diminished by development can be mitigated and potentially improved through backyard native landscaping. The guide is a tool but relies on policy to be successful and we accomplished that with the support of the planning board in the review and approval process, uh, directing applicants to include natives in the landscaping with review by the CAC. It also, uh, it's also dependent on cooperation of the applicants. We found many developers actually embracing this new model. Uh, the native landscapes create the potential for a perceptual and cultural shift for homeowners and incorporate sustainable actions in their daily lived experiences in their own backyard. So we've been encouraged by our planning board support and the use of the guide by other CACs around and outside the county, posting links to the guide and using it for their site plan reviews. Ultimately, though, the next step is an enforceable policy uh, for 70% natives, which is the threshold that the experts uh, regard for habitat value to show quantifiable results demonstrating sustainability benefits. We've had other challenges though, and I did wanna mention them, two items that I think other municipalities will be facing. Currently, we have an application for a solar array that'll clear a hillside in the gates of Heaven Cemetery. And I think that a policy that trades off forests for renewables is uh, not, in our view, sustainable. Renewable energy uh, uh, need, doesn't need to be a zero sum. So the town has numerous sites along the 9A corridor with clusters of large parking areas and big box uh, rooftops. And we'd like to see that included uh, rather than uh, loss of natural resources. Another is the uh, reconsideration of stormwater uh, protection plans that rely on storm frequency and intensity measures. Um, well, I, I don't know if that gonging is the end of my yes, the gonging is the out of time. We're so and sorry. Well, Stormwater is a big issue that we'd like to see reviewed uh, based on the current conditions of climate change that uh, Thank you, change the nature of storm. Thank, Thank you, you, Stephen. Thank you. We're sorry you got gonged, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mount Vernon. Um, so we have Councilwoman Janice Duarte with us. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, Janice Duarte, Councilwoman in the City of Mount Vernon. And thanks to a strong public will to protect our trees, on December 23rd, 2020, the City Council unanimously adopted an amendment to Section 252 of the City Code establishing a robust tree ordinance. The ordinance covers public and private trees and articulates the intrinsic value trees represent as part of our environment, our community, and our day-to-day -day quality of life. The passage of the ordinance wasn't easy. It was really accomplished by an unwavering citizen-driven public policy initiative, which had been in the works for over seven years. 
We finally realized our goal in late 2020 by building bridges, fostering collaboration, and bringing key stakeholders, such as our elected officials, the hardworking employees of DPW, our law department commissioners, and the public together to hash out the vision, the plan, and its execution. This legislation, legislative action has opened many doors for the, for the city. In January, we restored our tree city status, and we will celebrate Arbor Day with our first community tree planting on April 30th. There are two key components of the ordinance that will really secure its future. It establishes a tree advisory board and a tree fund independent of the city operating budget. The tree advisory board consists of five members, three of which will be residents. And this should really help ensure that we reach our goals. <clears throat> um, and we're in the process of building out this board now. In addition, the tree fund will support our tree planting programs throughout the year. In fact, it's already borne fruit. It's enabled the city to hold bad actors accountable. We recently had a private property owner in violation of city ordinances who made many changes to their property, including cutting down trees. The city held them accountable by requiring a $35,000 contribution to the tree fund. So this will go a long way to help us plant new trees and really jumpstart our initiatives. Um, so there's really still so much work to do. Over my time on the council, we remediated illegal dumping on Memorial Field. We've passed and funded the tree ordinance and the tree fund. Uh, we're working diligently to repair our sewers to keep our waterways clean. And we're currently implementing a gas leaf blower ban as well. So we're really fortunate to have resilient public policy advocates um, in our residents. And we're excited about being an active part in the supportive and knowledgeable environment and environmental network in the city, the county, and in the state. And so thank you, everyone. I just wanted to highlight a few things that Newcastle is doing. We have our gas leaf blower ban going in effective June 1st. We're excited about that. We continue our food scrap recycling program. Um, we do have a take it or leave it shed that we uh, is open every Saturday. People come and bring um, almost anything they want and other people can come and shop for free to take the stuff. So it's very, very popular in our town. We are applying in a couple of months for bronze certification under the Climate Smart Communities Program. And the last thing I wanted to highlight is that we're hosting a webinar on youth environmental advocacy and activism. It's on April 11th and we would welcome everyone to attend and we'll put the link in the chat. That's perfect, thank you so much. Um, okay, now we have New Rochelle, please. Um, yep. I have two people listed here. So um, you take it away, whoever's actually going to be speaking. Thank you, that's me, Jane Peister, on behalf of uh, New Rochelle. So we have two organizations. We are a, a city of 80,000, just under 80,000 people. So. Um, we have challenges of our own, but we have two very active with really good, intelligent people, um, two organizations. One is NRAC, which is right there listed in front of you, and the other is Energy Conservation Advisory Committee, um, and they work on their own, and we have just um, coordinated together, which has been a really vibrant um, Zoom conference every time we meet. Um, the top three successful programs I'd like to highlight are um, because we're such a large community with many diverse economic and uh, uh, racial, you know, the diversity is New Rochelle. Um, we focus high, have a hard, large focus on education. And so we have um, established Greener, which is spelled with an NR at the end for New Rochelle. Um, greener April. So with Earth Month, we're going to be doing quite a bit of education, um, many multi multiple forums, some by Zoom, some live. Um, we're working through all that still right now. Um, we also have a partnership with New Rochelle High School Green Club, which is really active. We, got, we have some excellent high school students and even middle school is interested. And so that is our future for all of us. And um, we are, uh, they're gonna be presenting apparently later, but they're doing some great things. Um, 
the last thing that I want to say is we are going to work hard at establishing a citywide compost program, similar to the one in Mamaroneck and um, Scarsdale. And so we look forward to perhaps joining that group and, and learning to That's it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to just jump in for one second and say that I hear a lot of people have a bunch of events coming up, which is wonderful. And Sustainable Westchester has our community calendar on our website, which is meant to curate those events. And I'm sending out an email actually later today about how to use that as a resource and how to navigate it. Um, and it's all self-submitted. So please feel free to put your events there. And we often pull from that calendar to spotlight different communities um, each Wednesday. So please use us as a resource. Austining, and so we have Dana Levenberg, um, town supervisor, and she's uh, representing Austining today. And she also, I have to say, full transparency, as Peter said, is on our Sustainable Westchester board. Dana? Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, thanks so much. And I'm humbled by all the work that's going on around the county by my colleagues. Um, we have lots of great work going on here in town of Austin as well. Thanks so much to our partners, Green Austin, um, which is our sustainability committee and our EAC. And I think Mitzi Alex is on, including um, coming down the pike, we will be the first municipality in Westchester to purchase a fully electric minibus for our senior nutrition program. And that's thanks to all the help that we got from Sustainable Westchester. But I've been asked to discuss our work on adopting solar and battery energy storage codes. We worked with NYSERDA's model codes to look at how we could make Town of Austin a place for solar developers and battery energy storage developers to find a predictable outlet for development, but without overwhelming our community with these projects. The model codes were used as a jumping off point, which we tweaked to better fit the town of Austin and our comprehensive plan and emphasize our desire to focus on already paved and or already cleared properties. To that end, we established a floating zone for both of these types of developments so that the town board could have a bit more control over where the most appropriate sites would be. Our aging religious institutions turned out to be the first benefactors of these codes, as we have two projects, one of each in either final planning or approved stages, um, shovel ready, um, in one case for our solar canopy community solar project and uh, battery energy storage. In the case of Mary Noel Fathers and Brothers Seminary property, the town was able to help connect these religious institutions or this religious institution with a solar developer, developing these codes and establishing a review process, which ensures the proposed developments make sense in the context of the town has allowed us in all cases so far to assist um, an institution to remain economically viable through the development of solar or battery energy storage with this alternative to selling off property, subdividing or development. So, and that partnered with uh, Community Solar is a huge benefit to our community. We're happy to see that these codes have enabled these institutions, um, which are certainly important to the heart of the character of community to stay viable. And um, in the process, in the review of at least one of these projects, we discovered some beekeeping going on and we didn't have a beekeeping uh, code. So we've simultaneously adopted beekeeping legislation as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dana. Um, okay, and now we have the village of Austin, actually, and we have uh, Maddie from the Environmental Advisory Council and Green Austin. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Maddie Zahach. I'm the assistant village manager um, in Austin, but I'm sort of also speaking on behalf of our EAC and Green Austin. Um, I'm very excited to be joining with all of you this morning. Uh, the village is working closely with our partners, as I mentioned, on the EAC and Green Austin, as well as our friends in the town of Austin, to look at every project we put forth through the lens of sustainability. And we have many exciting projects in the queue that reflect that, including the design of our new Indian Brook water treatment plant, which thanks to a grant from EAC, will feature a green roof, something we'd like to introduce on more of our municipal buildings. Um, as Padma mentioned earlier from Briarcliff, we're also working with Briarcliff, the town of Austin, and Lauren at Sustainable Westchester on our Energy Smart Community Campaign, which has been a great learning experience for our residents and our staff. Uh, we're looking forward to the next webinar presentation, which will be conducted in Spanish. Last spring, the village passed our, for our very first wetlands legislation, which requires an additional level of review before construction within the regulated area or a 100 foot check zone. And we also purchased our very first all electric fleet vehicles, which are used by our code enforcement team. And quite a uh, few, um, electric vehicle chargers are en route thanks to all of the recent incentives. 
Green Austin and our EAC will be working with us on an educational campaign this spring and summer related to our DEC Urban Forestry Grant, where we will be retreeing two of our busiest downtown parks with 80 native species trees, especially fitting since the village was named a tree city for the first time in 2020. Some projects we're preparing for this year will be a tree replacement ordinance for both privately owned and municipal trees. Uh, Councilman Duarte, I, I might be giving you a call. Um, adopting New York stretch code, getting the word out about our Austin 100 campaign and the personal carbon tracker. And at long last, beginning the pursuit of climate smart and clean energy community designations. Finally, we miss seeing everybody at last year's Austin Earth Day, but we hope you'll join us for Austin's Earth Week beginning on April 17th, the 10th time we're celebrating in Austin. All the information can be found at greenaustin.org. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined today. Austin is proud to be part of such a great team here in Westchester. Thank you. Thank great, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Maddie, we love that you were like making a connection already with the councilwoman. That's perfect. That's exactly the point here today. Um, okay, next up we have Peak Skill, please. And we have Kathleen. My name is Kathleen Barthelmas. I'm the chair of the Conservation Advisory Council here in Peak Skill. And we are just taking off with so many exciting initiatives. I work with a great group of eight other volunteers and we take on many tasks, divide the work, and uh, we are supported by the mayor and council, as well as city staff. I wanna highlight just two efforts most recently worked on. The first is that we are developing a natural resources inventory. This is something that CACs are advised to do by New York State. In this, we gather information about peak skill and put it all into one place by creating GIS maps of important features and it will be used by the planning department, the planning commission developers, and it's just a really wonderful tool. In order to do this, it, we applied to the Hudson River Valley Greenway for a grant, which is a matching grant, and we would use the $10,000 that we received to hire a consultant to help us write the text that goes into the um, inventory. Um, one of our CAC members took a course to learn how to create the GIS maps, and um, that will be part of the, um, of the matching funds. We worked with Nate Nardi Cyrus at Hudson River Estuary Program. He created a habitat summary for us, which will be used in the final product. The city staff created an RFP for the consultant, which is being launched, being launched today. Launched today. We have two weeks to um, complete the project, uh, two years to complete the project, and we hope to have it done by then. Uh, the second thing I wanna highlight is that we realized that Peekskill did not have a law protecting our trees when we tried to become certified as a Tree City USA a few years ago. So we approached the council and the staff, we researched other tree ordinances and created a draft and the um, staff is now working on the final product. We consulted with Mount Vernon, um, that wonderful uh, citizens group that managed to get a um, tree ordinance passed just in December. Uh, Peekskill has many beautiful mature trees, but many have been lost to disease and development and a lack of protection from the law is the cause of that. The tree canopy is important, not just because trees look nice, but because they create many environmental benefits. Two other things that we are working on presently is to develop a food scraps recycling program. And we have been working under the guidance and generosity of the village of Scarsdale CAC, who is helping us uh, work out all the details. We are also joining with Greenberg Nature Center uh, to sell composter equipment and um, that will, will be um, Peekskill residents can order. It goes to Greenberg and then we bring it to Peekskill to get picked up. Um, we are also becoming a pollinary pathways community. We are looking to develop community solar and I could go on and on, but I just wanna say that I learned so much from these gatherings and I thank you everyone for their hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And thanks for all of the collaboration you're doing uh, around the county with other communities. So next we have the village of Pelham and we have Yana Chan, please. 
Hi, I'm Yana Chan, co-chair of the SAB of the Village of Pelham. The SAB is part of our Climate Smart Communities Task Force, and we frequently collaborate with two townwide environmental groups, EcoPel, a not-for-profit organization, and Pelham Eliminates Plastics, a high school group. So the village successfully applied for funding from the New York State 2019 Zero Emission Vehicle Infrastructure Grants Program. Uh, the grants cover the cost of equipment and service contracts for two level three and three level two dual port chargers. These will be the first public charging stations to be installed in the village. And they'll be located in the downtown central business district in parking areas open to the public 24 seven. The coordinated efforts of volunteers, elected officials, administrators, and a clean energy consultant made this initiative possible. Steps also included passing resolutions to adopt the complete streets policy, the installation of EV charging stations, and the encouraged use of electric fleet um, vehicles. Other projects include the food scraps recycling program we're launching this month and our current Energy Smart Homes community campaign with Sustainable Westchester. Um, our challenges are in navigating between the advisory, advocacy, and implementation roles of our municipal volunteer body. And Pelham's a small municipality, so we have very few staff to manage the administrative requirements of these uh, CSC and CEC programs. Our goals for this year are to adopt New York stretch, the unified solar permit, and add tree canopy protection and street tree regulations. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Anna. Um, okay, next we have Pleasantville, please, and and Helen. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. So the three things I'm going to highlight are the 50/50 uh, tree um, planting program we have in Pleasantville, where a resident can choose a tree from a list that we have. They can go off the list, but we prefer they stay with the list. Just to keep it simple, uh, the DPW will plant the tree. It has to be in the front yard, visible to the public. And um, the resident pays half, the village pays half, and then the resident maintains the tree. It's been really successful in um, replenishing the tree canopy here. A uh, second project we worked on, uh, we have a pond in Pleasantville uh, with a park around it, Nanahagen Pond and Park. And we had a fantastic um, Trees for Tribs event in October during COVID, uh, where Anna Palmer from the DEC had scoped the area with one of our CAC members and um, suggested some shrubs. And then she came down from New Paltz with 105 shrubs and 10 river birch saplings. And we used uh, volunteers. We had three volunteer sessions Friday through Sunday morning and um, managed to get them all planted. And it's been a um, very visible way to show the public uh, about restoration. The third thing we have is through another group in the village, Pleasant Hill Recycles. They worked with, um, Scarzel, Ron Schulhoff and Michelle Sterling to create a food scrap drop-off program. Uh, we launched that in 2018 and um, it's running pretty well. Uh, we have another village committee, a climate smart action uh, task force. That is, uh, we achieved bronze level in 2019. Um, our biggest problems now are uh, wetlands and leaf blowers, and um, the Sawmill River Parkway work that some of you may have had to drive past. Thanks. Thank you Thank so you, much, Helen. Helen. Oh, sorry, Peter. No, <laughs> that's all right. Okay, up oh, next, I'm trying to advance the slides. Okay, Porchester. Greg, I see you here. Are Greg Hamilton, are you actually representing the Porchester Sustainability Committee this morning? I am representing um, Brandon. Oh, I'm sorry, Brandon. Hi, how are you? I apologize. No, no worries. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I'll start my two minutes now. 
Um, okay. <laughs> so good, morning, everyone. good morning, everyone. I am from the Port Chester Sustainability Committee, and a couple of our members are on the call at the moment, like Greg. So we are a small committee that began in 2019 when Port Chester residents decided to work with our municipal government in launching a food composting program. Since then, we have launched our village-wide composting initiative, and we have about 50 food scrappers that have all come directly from digital outreach. Uh, it's been difficult during the pandemic, but we hope to get back to community events soon to actually demonstrate the benefits of this type of initiative. So we are also going to begin coordinating how to get that composted soil back to distribute to our participants. The first program uh, that we were able to launch was this food scrapping program, and this is because our neighbors in Westchester took the time to welcome us into their communities and show us their existing programs. Scarsdale at the very beginning provided many helpful resources on the topic which is a perfect example of how important these intermunicipality conversations move our shared goal forward. Our team is now also a committee of six. So we recently just added a new resident a couple weeks ago. So we are slowly growing and we are trying to attract attention and are working to connect the community through digital mediums. The goal is to encourage conversations on sustainability and steps we as a village can take to model the environment that prioritizes the environment. If you have been to Port Chester recently, you may have also noticed it is continuously growing out of its village shell and increasingly more urban. Our committee understands that we may never recoup the forest-like aesthetic that is common in Northern Westchester, but we do know that there have been multiple leaps in technology, science, and research where we can use it to make urban spaces more sustainable. We are actively considering options to pursue on this topic. We also have been proposed the potential just recently of helping our village hall transfer its heating to a geothermal system. So though we are a young group, we are actively trying to coordinate with our village entities on options that benefit sustainability and village populations as a whole. At the municipal level in Port Chester, climate change has not been discussed, but we hope to change that. We see a green economy for Port Chester that comes from leveraging its unique cultural vibrancy. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. And I'm Brands, and sorry about the um, confusion. No um, so, we, so we have Pound Ridge now and Ellen, please. Uh, thank you, Sustainable Westchester, for the opportunity to talk about the Invasives Project Pound Ridge, or TIP. TIP is an all-volunteer initiative started by Carolyn Sears and Marilyn Shapiro that is unique in the area. Volunteers from TIP walk residential properties with the homeowner to identify invasive plants, recommend appropriate mechanical management methods, and point out native plants that often go unrecognized. This consultation is led by a seasoned volunteer who is accompanied by a less experienced partner. A consultation typically takes two hours and homeowners receive a follow-up written report. TIP is a partner with Lower Hudson Prism and recommendations to homeowners are based on New York's or Connecticut's list of invasive species and management methods. TIP's goal is to educate residents about invasive and native plants and promote good land stewardship. But there is an added benefit to the town and the region generally. In Pound Ridge, 59% of land is privately owned. In other towns, that figure is most likely higher. TIP gives us, the town and conservation organizations, a window into the state of existing invasives, as well as emerging threats, pests, and pathogens on land we would otherwise not have access to. There's a close but important collaboration between TIP and the Pollinator Pathway Project, which is a conservation board initiative. As one of our pollinator pathway guidelines, we recommend that people schedule a TIP consultation. And during TIP consultations, the volunteers promote the ideas of the pollinator pathway. One of the keys to the success of TIP has been community outreach through print and social media sites and word of mouth. The organizational structure is simple and in today's world could even be called low tech. One person is responsible for scheduling consultations. She uses email and an Excel spreadsheet. Follow-up reports use a template. The cost of the program is negligible. In Pound Ridge, TIP has been amazingly successful, and it's been rewarding for volunteers and homeowners. We're, we're open to sharing the system with anyone interested, setting up a similar program. And if I can, I'll put that information, the contact information in the chat. Thanks. Great, thanks. And we look forward to you putting that in the chat. Thanks, Ellen. Okay, um, next we have uh, Rye. Uh, Rice Sustainability Committee and Patty Caparelli. Hi, everybody. So the City of Rye has both a Conservation Commission Advisory Council, which is chaired by Tracy Stora, and a Sustainability Committee. 
The committee was formed in 2010 and it was tasked with creating a sustainability plan and a baseline greenhouse gas emission inventory. And this plan, which took two years to create, focused on achieving critical sustainability goals while conserving rise natural coastline beauty and robust economy. And this is our most important accomplishment as this city approved document is the guide we follow as we create popular programs and resources for our community. Another major accomplishment was in 2011 when the city of Rye was the first municipality in Westchester County to pass a retail shopping bag law, banning all plastic shopping bags distributed at the point of sale. And also in 2011, we launched our annual green screen film series in partnership with Rye Country Day School. Where I was also the first town in Westchester to sim simultaneously start a curbside and drop off food scrap recycling program. Um, and our partner, our program success are due to our community partners. Um, the Healthy Yard program, which featured numerous events from leaf mulching demos to how to talk to your landscaper to healthy yard, healthy pets was supported by the Rye Nature Center, J Heritage Center, garden clubs, and many more nonprofits and um, over the years. And to learn more about community engagement, which is necessary for both climate action and policy change, you can visit our breakout room. Um, our current goals include a Monarch way station, permanent curbside FSR service of police patrol, EV updating our greenhouse gas inventory and sustainability plan, a stronger tree ordinance, Tree planting by impact clean energy actions. Thank you. Thanks, Patty. Um, okay, Rybrook and Alexandra is unfortunately had a, a family emergency. So Michelle Delafontaine, who is our program director for business development and a Rybrook resident and part of the committee, will actually uh, step in for her. Yes, thank you and good morning. Uh, I, I didn't prepare for this, but I can tell you that uh, Rybrook has been very active. Uh, we uh, were one of the first to ban uh, plastic bags and plastic straws and uh, greening businesses around us. Uh, but we also uh, picked up very quickly on the food scrap program that we are, you know, uh, and we thank the county for uh, extending uh, to uh, help us uh, picking up uh, the, on the curbside. That would be a great program for us because that's one of the barriers to expanding the food scrap programs. Um, I, I brought the props here, I don't know if you could. So we also are moving ahead with healthy yards and we're promoting it. This is to be planted in my garden uh, very soon. And you know, I, I, all I can say is like, I, I, I brought the props and, and please everyone uh, follow up on us and do the food scrap program that will be great and healthy yards. This is what I have to say. Thank you. Very good, <laughs> Michelle. Love props. Thank you so much for like stepping in at the last minute. Um, okay, next we have Scarsdale and Michelle Sterling, please. Hi, Michelle. Hello, this is Michelle Sterling. I chair the Conservation Council in Scarsdale. Thanks for having this today. Um, we'll run through all the different programs we're doing. It's a lot for two minutes. I just first want to highlight that um, just please reach out to myself at michellesterling1 at gmail.com for any programs that you're interested in. We're volunteers, we're happy to help everybody put in place any of the programs that we've done. Um, the one that I know a lot of people have been talking about is food scrap recycling. We were the first town in Westchester to do it. We started back in January of 2017. It's been really, it's really taken off um, um, throughout the county. We've been helping towns throughout the county put it in place. It's now in, um, over half the municipalities in the county, which is fantastic. Um, it's easy to do and um, it's inexpensive. We're going to talk about it in the breakout session, but please, you know, set up um, a meeting with myself or with my sustainability partner, Ron Schulhoff. We'll give his information also. And we're happy to give tours of our recycling center. And I'll go through quickly um, all of the other recycling initiatives that we have so that when you come and, and we give you a tour, we'll just give all the information to you so you can put these things in place in your town. So one of the things that we have when you come to our recycling center, you see our food scrap recycling drop off spot. We also have cooking oil recycling in place now um, at no cost. These are all at no cost to the municipality. Um, the cooking oil gets picked up, gets turned into biofuel. We have textile recycling. It's a really uh, very popular program. All of the textiles get 
donated or recycled. We have metal recycling. The municipality uh, makes some money off of that. We have a plastic bag and film recycling program. So all of our, we partnered with Trex. All of our pl plastic bag and film goes to make Trex plastic decking and um, other plastic furniture that they make. Um, we also partnered with Furniture Share House. It's a great not-for-profit in Westchester County. Um, we have a bin for them. They pick up all of our um, used but usable furniture that um, residents donate. We have a take it or leave it area as well. And then a few other programs that we put into place in our community. We have mulching, mulch mowing on all of our village properties. We use no pesticides on any village properties. We put into place recycling bins, coordinated and labeled recycling bins at all 29 of our town parks. Happy to also share all the information on that. We have tennis ball recycling bins at all of our 26 tennis courts. We've converted all of our lights to LED street lights. We have special ones that are aesthetically pleasing for a sleepy Westchester town. Um, we also have put into place um, a successful tree code change to preserve our tree canopy. We have um, a successful solar code in place. And just last week, we passed a um, very restrictive gas blower leaf ban, which is going into effect on um, May 1st. We're happy to share all the details and how we did it with anyone. Um, we are converting our fleet to electric vehicles. And I'm not sure if I mentioned our take it or leave it shed, which is on pause right now, but it's ready to get back, get stepped back up. Um, we collaborate successfully on all these programs with our village administration, with our Department of Public Works and our Village Parks Department um, and our CAC, which is so active. We're a climate smart community now as well. Um, but my most important takeaway is, and I know this is a big list that I'm just running through, but the big takeaway is we're happy to get anyone started, happy to help happy to give, give tours. We have our DPW personnel present for our tours too. Um, so they can also speak with you or you municipal officials and um, just reach out to us. And we're happy to help you put these things in place in your town. It's not good enough that they're just in our town. They should be everywhere. So thank you for having me today. Thanks so much, Michelle. And, and I'm sure you're gonna have lots of people taking you up on that offer. So um, our next community please is Somers. Yeah, my name is Don Bleasdale. I'm the chair of the Somers Energy Environment Committee. And uh, thank you so much for having this uh, really informative, inspiring. Um, um, it's great to see all the work that's being done in the, in the, in the uh, county and all these towns. Um, so we, we have been um, over the years involved in um, energized solarized campaigns pretty successfully. Uh, we did achieve climate smart uh, certification. I'm actually not sure what level we are, but I'm um, going to be encouraging us to look back and see if we can get to the next, the next step. Um, most recently, we've had a really good response to community solar for all those who couldn't you know, get the solar panels on their own house for, for the various reasons. Um, so that's been really, really re a great program. And um, we've had a pretty good turnout in the town. Um, we have been putting in some electric charging stations. I know that's a big initiative statewide. So we're looking to do more of that. We, um, we did get a grant and, and do have a couple of municipal vehicles, I think now that are EVs. Um, we don't have a huge fleet, but we're looking to get more of that, um, more of that happening in the town. Um, uh, a, a difficulty over the years has been with complete streets. We've been trying to get more, more walkable areas, um, but due to the nature of the town, that's been sort of difficult. Obviously lack of funds. We're a volunteer community. We don't have any, uh, any, uh, um, any town funds to do this and to try to connect in some of the, uh, the trailways and the pathways that line through our town. We have a lot of old rail beds that are used for walking. So we're just trying to, on a bigger scale um, have a vision to try to connect the town and make it more livable, walkable, and all that. Um, uh, most recently, um, uh, we presented to the town board to to improve the building code. And I know New York is pushing the stretch, and I was actually uh, uh, eager to hear that a couple of towns have already done that. So I'm going to reach out to some of those members to see how they they got that passed. Um, we do have some builders in town that have been building to a pretty good standard. It actually um, the, the the way they've a combination of geothermal and whatever they've built their these new uh, townhouses to a standard that would pass the current building code. So trying to highlight some of the builders that are actually doing that um, in the town and making it work. So 
for those who think it's too onerous to, to increase the code and why would you do that and you know cause businesses to spend more money, there's a, obviously a good reason to do it. And so we're trying to promote that um, and get that done. Um, so um, yeah, that's pretty much, oh, we, uh, community gardens. Yes, a, a lot of great information. We're trying to get more involved with that trying to help people uh, sustainably garden. Um, I've heard from obviously many towns, the, the leaf blowers. So that might be something we need to put on our, on our agenda to try to get that uh, uh, going as well. So that's about it. Thank you. Next is Tarrytown and we have Dean from the Tarrytown Environmental Advisory Council. Yes, thank you uh, for uh, doing this and, and including all of us. Um, uh, TIAC, as you may know, is um, uh, been around for a long time. We have nine uh, volunteer council members, a handful of active volunteers, trustee liaison, and we've incorporated the Lakes Committee, which was a former separate entity within Terrytown, into uh, uh, Terrytown Environmental Council. Um, and uh, we also have a liaison to the Tree Commission. Uh, we have monthly public meetings. We have a, an e-newsletter that precedes that, that's um, also published in the local uh, uh, online newspaper and on our website. TerrytownEnvironmental.org. if you'd like to visit the website and see some other things about us. We do weekly tabling at our farmer's market, bi-weekly, I should say, tabling at our farmer's market for outreach to the public. We have a lot of Earth Month uh, initiatives planned starting April 17th, including cleanups and invasive removal, educational walks, family events, and uh, we also have an annual eco-fair in the summertime. Um, among successes we've had here in Terrytown, uh, we're one of the first voluntary food scrap recycling programs with full-time drop-off site uh, open to the public. And we've sold over 400 uh, uh, collection kits to local residents. We also have an IMA in place sharing the program with Sleepy Hollow, which is in an adjacent town. Um, we've had one of the first community solar projects up and running now on a large building here in Terrytown. Uh, we're a CCA village. We have LED street lights, we've done shoreline remediation, solarized program, um, we're a tree city USA, we do open space protection, we have EV chargers, hybrid vehicles, native plantings on village land and things like that. We have a new community garden that's in the planning stage right now. We're uh, trying, to, trying to get that going this year, but we'll see if that actually happens because it requires a lot of cooperation with the village. Um, we have a lot of pollinator pathway gardens in place, and we're building several more on village property, um, including one big one on our library that's using funds from a successful crowdfunding program. Uh, we raised, raised thousands of dollars in, in that effort. Uh, we have new trails established in our woods and uh, lakes area that have been built by volunteers, and we're incorporating those into wayfinding signage around the, the village. Um, as far as challenges go, Terrytown's on an austerity budget like a lot of villages are, so new environmental initiatives kind of need to be self-funded or grant-funded, so that slows things down. We've also had fairly slow progress toward clean energy and climate smart certification because the village hasn't really established a ta task force to work on that. Um, so we're, we're progressing slowly toward our, our bronze certification, hopefully the later this year. Um, and uh, time's up, I guess, but uh, just wanted to say we also have resistance in the village toward uh, restrictions on gas powered leaf blowers that we have to try to get around. So thanks a lot and uh, enjoy the rest. Thank you so much, Dean. Um, and then for our next, we have Tucker House Sustainability Committee. And I think we have both Don and Frank. So, so you guys take it away. Thank you, Maria. Um, we, we, I'm Don Crosby, president of the Tucker House Environmental and Sustainability Committee. We have nine members on our committee, two work for the village, two are high school students. When we volunteered for this uh, task, we had no idea how fortunate we would be. The mayor, the board of trustees, and the Department of Public Works have been very supportive. Our accomplishments, food scrap recycling, we use Scarsdale as a model. We started in January 1st, 2020. We currently have people delivering to the DPW yard 24 seven. We are planning street pickup. We collected 20 tons in one year. Remember, Tuckahoe is less than one square mile. The neighboring communities are also participating. We've been working with Sustainable Westchester for wind and solar electricity. 
They gave us presentations. They met with our mayor, the trustees, and the residents, and participated in the DPW Day. Effective today, yay, Tuckahoe is going with Constellation New Energy. We had a 6% opt-out, which is a small percentage. Honeybees. We are trying to change the village ordinance regarding honeybee hives. Our village board gave us a trial basis, so we are trying to see if there are any problems with having honeybees. Remember, we're, we're a concentrated village. So we are working with two organizations within uh, Tuckahoe to put beehives on their roofs. Frank, you want to talk about uh, electric charging stations? As I sit here in the dark, everybody would think that our first sustainable initiative is cutting back office lighting, but that's not <laughs> the case. Uh, but no, we're talking about EV charging stations. We're in the process of installing 24 uh, double vehicle charging stations throughout the village of Tuckahoe. Uh, we're very fortunate to have two train stations and a thousand parking uh, spots for uh, those that are looking to commute. Um, and it gives us a perfect opportunity to, to sell, our, sell this uh, vehicle charging station to those that want to purchase vehicles. You know, it's the old saying, like, feel the dreams. If you build it, they'll come. And we're hoping that with all these vehicle stations, uh, more people in the village of Tucko and our surrounding neighbor uh, would, would buy more vehicles that are EV. That's all I really have. Um, next, we have Yonkers and we have Jason Baker. Um, who is with the Yonkers Green City Advisory Committee. Hi, Jason. Oh, do we have Jason? Hold on. Oh, there you go. Sorry. There you go. See you. Okay. okay. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Jason Baker, Director of Sustainability City of Yonkers, Chair of the Green City Advisory Committee for the City of Yonkers. Uh, as you know, Yonkers is <clears throat> the fourth largest city in the state, 200,000 residents. Uh, we've been designated a uh, both a climate smart community and a clean energy community. In 2013, Mayor Spano launched the LED Streetlight Replacement Project to replace all thousand all 12,000 of our city's cobra heads with LEDs. Uh, the project is saving taxpayers $18 million in energy costs over 10 years and reducing car Yonkers carbon footprint by 3,000 tons annually. Additionally, in pre preparing for future storms and improving resiliency, the city partnered with Nightboat to replace all lighting units at JFK Park with new solar and wind-powered lighting units that require no in-ground lighting or reliance on the actual grid, electrical grid, excuse me, allowing them to remain operational during floods and power outages and making JFK Marina Park the first off-grid city park in the region and likely in the state. As part of its efforts to reduce emissions, the city of Yonkers is taking action to transition its fleet to electric vehicles. Mayor Spano has enacted new green fleet standards, making EVs the default for light duty vehicle purchasing. The mayor has also implemented a fleet and fuel management system to better control and track vehicle and fuel use. And plans are in place for a large citywide expansion of EV charging stations. Yonkers also hosts New York's first dockless shared micromobility pilot, currently partnering with Bird Scooters, providing a convenient, low-cost, emission-free transportation option for Southwest Yonkers residents and visitors to get around the city. Yonkers was among the first cities in New York State to establish a green building ordinance and green development standards. In 2019, the city of Yonkers also became the first big city in New York State to establish an open commercial property assessed clean energy financing program to assist commercial building owners in paying for improved energy efficiency and renewable energy systems. Uh, Mayor Spano recently signed legislation to fast track community solar projects, several of which are soon to be online, and the city is currently developing its own community solar program, utilizing city buildings and parking facilities. The mayor also recently introduced and signed legislation authorizing Yonkers to join the Westchester Power CCA, utilizing the green energy option in partnership with Sustainable Westchester. In addition to offering styrofoam recycling to residents, we have eliminated the annual use of two million styrofoam trays at Yonkers Public Schools. The city offers residents free access to recycling information and scheduling through the Yonkers Recycling Coach app. We've expanded curbside recycling for quarterly textile and e-waste pickup. And Mayor Spano has established a program providing for free reuse bags uh, for any resident in need. And as you may know, Mayor Spano and the city of Yonkers led a coalition of municipalities across the Hudson Valley known as the Hudson River Waterfront Alliance. This was to stop a barge anchorage expansion proposal that would have essentially lined our riverfront communities with petroleum carrying barges. The city is also very proud of our achievements to improve our urban environment through initiatives like the Salmon River Daylighting, in which three phases have now been complete in downtown Yonkers and which incorporates a pollinator pathway. Uh, I want to thank the Yonkers Green City Advisory Committee members for their partnership in, this, in these efforts. And uh, thank you to Peter, County Executive Latimer, and all the organizations involved in putting this conference together and the great job that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Okay, and um, our last community is your, your town. We'll then have some quick closing remarks and then we'll move into the breakout session. So Sarah. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. 
You have two uh, this minutes. This is Holly Thompson. I am sit on uh, one of seven that sit and serve on the town of North Salem Conservation Advisory Council. Um, I'm sorry, Captain Daniels uh, was supposed to speak. I don't know what happened, but I will try my best to, to uh, do a quick overview. Um, first, I'd like to say that none of this would ever be possible without the support and help of everyone in the whole community, um, statewide, local wise. And it's been wonderful listening to um, everybody that does what we do. Um, I can only say that we work as a big collaboration. Our town supervisor, Warren Lucas is amazing. Uh, our planning board, Cynthia Curtis, um, they work, we work very closely with everyone. Um, in fact, we've, they've adapted the CAC into town code. We go on a light of sight visits. Um, the zoning board loops us into all of the development that's going on in our town. Uh, we're working on, uh, Catherine Daniels was appointed as our climate smart a representative and we are working on trying to become certified. We've done our LED uh, town lights. I believe we're installing an electric car station. Um, we're recent, we're going, we're planning a initiative with our uh, library for an Earth Day so we can really educate our community more. Um, we like to be a little more proactive in the food and, and scrap waste program. We work also closely with our open land uh, people because our town is, um, we've got a lot of open land and a lot of uh, wetlands and important New York State um, watershed property. Um, I love some of the statements that I heard our sustainability is really our quality of life. Um, great work, great ideas from everybody. Um, and I look forward to some of the breakout sessions. Okay, so we'll go back to Yorktown or Yorktown, are you there? Calling all Yorktown. If not, um, we also would like to ask if White Plains, is there somebody from uh, White Plains that could give a uh, two minutes uh, on what they're working on. I can do a White Plains update really briefly. Okay. Hi everyone. I'm Lauren Bryce. I work at Sustainable Westchester and I am a member of the White Plains Sustainability Committee. And right now we're working on a food scrap recycling program. The DPW has organized the bin drop off at the Gedney Yard and the Scarsdale team of Ron and Michelle are helping us very much with the compost collection kits. and. Um, really exciting. The city has also launched a solar project that is going to like quadruple the amount of solar in the county by putting solar on the buildings in the city of White Plains. So that's pretty exciting. And I think it will be a community solar type of model as well. And if the mayor was here or Jill, they probably would mention there's a project that they're working on with Con Ed for people to charge their cars at a lower rate during the night. And that's a pilot program as well. That, that's probably enough. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for jumping in. Okay, so before we rush into the breakout session, um, on behalf of Peter and Ann and myself and Sustainable Westchester, FCWC in the county, we wanna thank everyone so much for, for joining us today. This was a great pleasure for us to put together. Um, we learned so much about all of the amazing initiatives that all of you are working on and we're really, um, ready to dig in and certainly I can speak for Sustainable Westchester as well with helping you with those challenges and your goals going forward. Um, you heard from a lot of uh, um, organizations at the start who are also here to help partner with you and move you all forward in your, um, in your goals for the coming year and beyond. Um, and we look forward to convening this again on a quarterly basis, maybe not as many as 222 people, uh, but maybe, uh, you know, Sustainable Westchester certainly would love to hear from you all on an ongoing basis, as I know with the county and FCWC. And we'd love, of course, 
to maybe um, convene these on a quarterly basis uh, as roundtables around uh, different topic areas that we can dig in and maybe come to solutions together. And we all know that the power here is in everyone's collective efforts and we applaud you your municipalities, your committees, and all of your volunteers in everything you do and how much you get done. So I'm going to quickly go back to screen sharing for. Yep, and I, uh, I want to give Ann. I want to give Ann the opportunity to sure. say a few closing words, and then I'll. I'll Absolutely. I'll yeah. Okay. Sorry, Ann. I'm just going to move. Oh no, no, no. Thanks. Forward. I'll keep it. Uh, thank you. I know I'll keep it very brief. I'm just um, always amazed to hear what's going on around the county. I, I, this county is full of such dedicated, creative, and uh, really um, collaborative, community-minded people. And I thank you all. It's very inspiring, and we've got a lot a lot of work that we can continue on so thank you okay so we have some breakout room instructions and, and um, i would i would like to just uh oh, i'm sorry thank you Peter. as well maria <laughs> I'm sorry. I feel the time pressure. We've been pressure. working on this for, for three months. and, and <laughs> I feel the time pressure. I'm so sorry. Go it's ahead. It's all good. We're, we're good with the time. We're good with the time. And uh, I just do want to thank you, Maria. And I want to thank Anne. Uh, we've been uh, working on this for a long time. I want to thank all the volunteers that have participated um, and all the volunteers that work on your CACs. It's what it's all about. And I really appreciate it. I also I do want to give one more plug to the League of Women Voters and their event uh, for the Climate Smart Communities. It's a great program. I think we're all participating in one way or another, uh, but they're going to help uh, with that. And there's links in the uh, chat and we'll put some more in there. And um, now I'll, I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Maria, for, um, you know, setting us up for the breakout session. Thank okay. you, everybody.